Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Boyce of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Giovanni Penichetti, who is a Canadian artist and art critic and denizen of the internet. He's actually hyper online or very much online. And in this conversation, we talk about online subcultures, particularly having to do with the right wing or dissident online subcultures, which kind of goes under the name of frog Twitter. And we kind of get into the definition and the um, anthropology of the internet. We also talk quite a bit about Canada and how Canada seems to be the playing ground where certain ideas from the globalist elite are being played out. Maybe, maybe not, but it's really interesting. Giovanni is incredibly, or Gio is incredibly well-read and highly respected within his sphere, and I'm glad to have him on my channel. And if you're interested in more of his work, check the links out in the description. He's a great writer and a very engaging speaker. So without further ado, here is Giovanni Pinichetti. Should I should I put my fez on? That is my that is my image. Would you appreciate that, Benjamin? Yeah, let me uh, let me put a cap on too. All right, okay. <laughs> I, can, I can do that. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There we nice. go. It is it is my my marquee, but the 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 black one though, not the red. One. The red one has yeah. other other spiritual meanings that I I don't want to dabble with. But oh, really? I'm yeah, yeah. That. Well, the story goes that the the Ottoman Turks slaughtered the Christians in in uh, Constantinople, and they dipped the fez in the blood. But you know, the black fez. I mean, it's I guess it's all right. So it's it's, it's a symbol <laughs> of pre-Islamic, uh, you know, pre-Islamic Constantine mysticism. So that's probably you know. Huh. I don't know, always like the aesthetic. Plus, it hides a bit of the Norwooding. So that's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Wait, but is there a spiritual significance? To oh, to the Fez? Yeah, tons of yeah, yeah, of course. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Um, there's the a great Robert Seffer video on it, but um, you know, yeah. But that gets into hairy territory. He, you know, he talks about the the <laughs> mid-century Germans and well, oh, yeah, get into it. <laughs> yeah, there's so much hairy territory. Yeah, everything's hairy territory nowadays. But nowadays, yeah. Uh, we're not streaming or anything, so I'm just going to cut no, in no. on the interview yeah. when it gets. Uh, yeah. Let me just start talking. Th it's very. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you. I'm very oh, impressed yeah, by you, your work. You, yeah, the, the uh, you as well. How do how do you say it? Um, the, the honor is mine. Uh, okay. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. The honor's yeah. all mine. Yeah. The honor's all. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm very very grateful for you. Uh, yeah. Very grateful for you. To, very gracious of you to. Uh, invite me so yeah hopefully i don't well, know what we're going to talk about but I guess well i don't know either like i was i've been i've been going through your your stuff like and, and my mind just I, I was sitting here and right before i pressed open the meeting i'm like i have no idea where to start <laughs> <laughs> i have that effect on people okay. um no yeah i mean well we could do the general introduction thing i guess it's always you know Sometimes yeah. on my podcast, it takes like an hour before we do that. So, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. Well, um, okay. So I know your 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 commentary is political on on some way, shape, or form, and you're part of this loose band of misfits that I think of as like the dissidents. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's different, and I think that they generally say that they're right as opposed to left. Um, and there's a lot of like kind of in group out group specifically with the left and, and then there's kind of like, but the right as a concept, I can't really get my head around it other than it's not left. I kind of understand that left is mm. towards centralization and towards the current regime, or at least the current regime is using leftism in order to consolidate power. Um, mm -hmm. but what is the right? And then what I really want to get into with you uh, is that can the right actually have an aesthetic of its own? Mm. And what would that be? Especially because you're an artist. Yeah. And wow. Two very, art. two, two, like, you know, right into it. What, what's the, the phrase they use? Don't bore us, get to the chorus. Right. <laughs> so it's like why every Corin song is a chorus song, you know, I'm a, well, I mean, I'm a huge fan of that, you know, early 2000s Chud culture, <laughs> not all, you know, pro wrestling. But anyways, yeah, those are great questions, Benjamin. Um, is there, can I call you Mr. Boyce or Benjamin? What do you prefer? Benjamin's great or Mr. Boyce or? 
Whatever, whatever it feels like to you. I, no, I trust I guess, your I guess settings. Benjamin, you know, where, yeah. you know, this, yeah, yeah. But no, that's a great question because I think that uh, it, it depends what you're talking about. I think by virtue, and I guess like, well, when you had the distributist on, uh, my friend Dave, you talked about this. Um, but okay, so before that, let's do the intro. This is kind of bothering me a bit because like yeah. I, I'm terrible with like introductions in terms of getting to them. So yeah, I am as you've alluded to, I'm an artist. Uh my by the way, my re- the kind of a rarity. My real name is actually Giovanni Penichetti. It's my real name and face. So many moons ago, I started I started as a writer. I started in what they would call like uh, quote unquote frog Twitter, which is I would say even before Trump in 2014, 2015. This was like the reactionary blog people but i was never like fully anorex because i'm more of a cultural writer that's like an art critic if you will yeah like because i'm currently writing a book on art criticism about art in the 21st century so like i had these high ideas about like i want to be a writer i'm not like those youtube people i'm i'm a writer i'm a theory self which i am you know i was just out of grad school and um you know i did i did my own art and uh so then i started off with like smaller blogs i started off actually my first big breakthrough was i wrote this essay in grad school that mentioned um who was popular on the the chan culture at the time uh the video artist nobody tm and i had a correspondence with the head editor and this was like very obscure video art that had like this early 2000s core website with Easter eggs everywhere that you could click on that led you down like different rabbit holes of writing and videos. Um, so I wrote an essay on this and it was like, had a lot to do with like, uh, cause my expertise is kind of a rarity for people in the E right or distant, right. E, you know, being online, which is like, I'm more in the tradition of like European continental thought and post-structuralism. And I started off with like a lot of Eastern religion stuff so, but by the time I went to grad school, like I ha- I went to a pretty unique program here in Canada. So I had like, you know, a knowledge and like all this stuff that a, a huge swaths of the right wing would be like, well, this is evil, which I mean, a lot of it is evil, but you know, that's <laughs> besides the point. <laughs> um, so then, you know, I wrote this paper, it was about Foucault and the Frankfurt School. But in the end, I, I wrote about this video artist, nobody TM, who was like considered like, Okay, so in terms of the influence, if you look at, like, this is my thesis, by the way. I actually wrote another paper about this. Like, okay, if you look at, like, any um, style of, like, content creation from, like, Frog Twitter onwards, like, if you look at video edits, or if you look at even, like, Sam Hyde and, like, the graphics and this obsession with early 2000s aesthetics mixed in with, like, what was known as, like, Hyperborean edits, right, where you have, like... Donald Trump on a Gartha on a submarine with mid-century Germans and the spinny wheels. Like a lot of that stuff, it didn't directly come from nobody TM, but nobody TM certainly like led the way to not like, not the hyperborean ads per se. Like there was no spinny wheels in there, but like the sort of obsession with lo-fi graininess and collaging like very obscure footage of like different people on the quote unquote edges of humanity. Um, and a lot of the video archives are still on YouTube, but the site has since been nuked. So anyways, like my essay was featured. I, I corresponded with nobody TM and my essay was featured on the website. It was like on the front page. And I'm like, you know, I was younger at the time and I was like, oh my God, right. Your favorite artist wants to like recognize mm. you. That was huge. Yeah. Um, and then that led to being, cause a source was actually, um, he's gone now. He left, uh, but he, he was a writer who had a website called Adam Wallace uh, and Adam Wallace featured my, because I, I featured one of his pieces of writing on Nobody TM in my article, in my essay for my critical theory program. So, and what year is this? This was like 2014. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, th- then, like, I started writing for these magazines. The biggest one at the time, because there was like a trend where people wanted to edit together all of these like little reactionary blogs and yeah. have them centralized. So the big one I was a part of was called Thermometer Magazine because I knew the editor who has since fallen from grace. Uh, 
not to mention what happened, but there is some allegations with doxing, blah, blah, blah. But I was part of the original Thermometer Magazine people. And like I had this, and that's what landed me on Twitter because all my friends were on Twitter and all of these writers that I respected, they were like, yeah, I like your stuff, Gio. Because I would write about like, you know, I had an article about like Pepe and Jordan Peters. And I had stuff like that, you know? I mean, nowadays, uh, you know, it's probably cool, but like a lot of that stuff back in the day was fresh and new and people were solidifying uh, what I think, and this leads into your second question, Benjamin, which is like a, a weird form of aesthetic politics that yeah. the E-Right has been engaged in, yeah. um, primarily through meme culture. And so a great resource, I don't know if you've had, I think you had her on, actually. Um, maybe you haven't, but let me, because I'm doing, uh, do, do you know the book Kill All Norton? Redact all normies. Sorry for YouTube purposes. Redact all normies <laughs> by Angela Nagel. And she uh, got totally reamed by the political left for it. But like, I, I have it next to me because I'm uh, in the process of writing my own book. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like what I would say is that, you know, the meme culture of the frogs in 2016 was like our hippie movement. And, you know, Joe Biden is sort of like, you know, when the hippies woke up in 1971 and like Richard Nixon was president, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, but <laughs> yeah. So I was in the background of all of this, right? Like I, I, it's interesting, you know, because I think like what compelled me to use my real name and face was that, you know, it was too linked to my artwork and my writing and everything. And I'm, I just, I don't know. I felt the need that I couldn't hide if you will. But other than that, like, I mean, Nowadays, like now that I've, I've, so then, okay, so then what happened was I Wait, was. Wait, hold on, hold in, on. Yeah, go. Sorry, sorry, okay. I'm just rambling. Uh, right. So, uh, frog Twitter. Yeah. yeah. What is that? Oh my God. Okay, where well, this is 101. Uh, okay, so I guess yeah. frog Twitter. I mean, I, I know that part of my audience doesn't even know what theory cell is, and I can only just take a guess at what theory cell is. So I just, I, oh, I gotta, right, we right, got to okay. clarify this because you're talking, yeah. you're not, you're, you're no longer in your, you're kind of poking Yeah, my out. bubble. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah poking the, into this the, weird interim place that I've been. Yeah, the frog in. ecology containment, <laughs> the, the atrium. <laughs> um, well, theory, you know, cell becomes a suffix. It originally comes from in cell, fem cell where a cell is like a phenotype of something. Yeah. So like, again, it, you know, these things originated as insults or memes, but then they take on a life of their own where it's sort of like, you know how like the political left, they'll use the term Chud. Yeah. But right? that's not a Chad. A Chud is not a Chad. No. So Chud no, is, Chud is like old. A... Chud like comes from the eighties. Or okay. old. It, yeah. I think like, yeah. In the 80s. Is it a derogatory term? It's well, you know, Chuds are like sloppy. subterranean beings, right? Okay. So, okay. Right. Okay. So, like, the, the political left would use the term chud as a derogatory, like, an unironic derogatory term for the sort of, like, stereotypical, you know, how would you say, ignorant, xenophobic, trailer park, heartland right winger. Okay. But then over time, like, the political right, you know, uses chud as the term of endearment. So you have, like, chud jack, like, the, all the memes of, like, the chud jack, and then, you know, chud becomes part of, like, common parlance right yeah you know the guy with glasses that says the west has fallen uh you know millions must be redacted right i can't get a girlfriend <laughs> the west has fallen millions must, you know millions <laughs> must die um so yeah so theory cell is a take on like so a cell okay. would be somebody who's isolated or who who's somehow uh a loser in a way specifically with regard incel would be somebody who can't get sex and is frustrated about that. Yes um, but then no. it's, it's yes turned no. around though. When you get to theory cell, it's like somebody who is, is so in their head that they can only yeah. connect to other people through like super heady meme means. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You're hundred percent right. But I would say that um, we could talk about incels because that's another object of my research for many years. Uh, because, you know, I think that like the term incel and even now fem cell, you know, again, to, to again, to theory, to theory, it, these are biopolitical categories, but I'll explain that, but I'll get, answer your question. Okay. So theory cell, gym cell, lit cell, someone who is like self-contained within their world, who can only really express a form of, how shall I call it, mediated socialization in this very uh, distinct way, 
Okay. And By mediated of, like, socialization, could we just yeah. say connection? Oh, connection's human, perfect. Yeah. Human connection. A connection that's distorted between the channels, right? Yeah. Huh. So a theory cell can only relate to things as everything becoming a grand theory. These are people because like, you got to realize it's not just the political right. It's also the left online too. We're all failed grad students. Okay. We're yeah. all failed normies. We're all, we're, you know, I'm a failed grad student because I didn't, you know, I applied for my PhD and I didn't get accepted. I should have tried harder, but like, you know, whatever <laughs> I was told by, I was told by my professors like Geo, do your own thing. Uh, my, you know, great mentor of mine he was my thesis advisor he's like geo you got to do your own thing man academia is not worth it anymore yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He, you know he got pissed off at the system uh anyways so yeah the, a theory cell is a take on like connection can only be had through uh an elaboration upon whatever niche academic topic that you're interested in. Okay. So like gym cells, like, you know, gym cells, like they're trying to looks max through, through you know, looks maxing is good, but like, you know, but what I would say, Benjamin, is that when it comes to cell culture or like all of these meme terminologies is that because of, you know, the nature of the online world, there's an inherent ambiguity in terms of, are they positive or negative? Yeah. They're, they're kind of in some between. I know, like, listen, this is another theory cell term. It's a spin thing, yeah. They're, they're liminal in between. They're in the between space. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're liminal. Because, you know, people can, like, take those terms as a form of identity and endearment and what Foucault called reverse discourse. Same with the Chud, right? Chud is reverse discourse. Okay. Chud is like saying, yes, I am a Chud, right? I, I am a giga Chud. I, I have Chudish tendencies. Um, So I think like it's very tricky because the way that people talk about things like the incel in popular culture and in media is very different from how they talk about themselves or even the language of like, oh, they talk about themselves. That is also another, I would say, biopolitical terminology because now you're starting to view them as a sociological object rather than like, you know, human beings. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and I know like a lot of people that are like, you know, millennial left people, they're like, you know, be a decent effing human being and like touch grass. Yeah. But, you know, the more I realized, and again, I, so in present day, let me finish. I, I didn't finish the introduction. So, but this is relevant because me and my friend Prudentialist, who is also on your show, we co host a, so I have my podcast called Content Minded. That's where mm-hmm. I interview people. And I do a show with Prudentialist called The Digital Archipelago. So we talk about this all the time. It's between my channel, Janet Productions, and his channel, the Prudentialist. And I also co-host with my good friend, Catherine D., who you should have on. Did you have? Have you ever yeah, had Yeah, I've Catherine had her. Yeah, she's wonderful. She is wonderful. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm I'm new co-host to the computer room. And hopefully, okay. I won't be leaving her anytime soon like her other co-hosts. Uh, you know, Catherine D. is a great friend of mine. She's like a big sister to me. And we're both sort of like weirdo online cultural anthropologists, if yes. you will. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, the frog Twitter thing. To, so that explains the theory selfing. Uh, you know, everyone, everything is theory. Everything is high, high minded. Everything has to be viewed through. And, you know, I have that tendency myself. So this is why I use the term theory self. But, you know, you asked me, what is frog Twitter? Now, frog Twitter means many things to many people. But generally... If I were to put a definition, now I'm not going to comment on people involved in Frog Twitter, the figureheads, because some of them have left, some of them have gone to war with each other. Uh, you know, there was a very famous one between two very massive figureheads, which I won't get into. I won't comment on, okay? Because I like to be a, you know, because like you, know, okay, Benjamin, you know, listen, we're we're similar in that we're friend to all people. We mm. have to be to get mm. guests on our shows. Mm-hmm. You know, we mm-hmm. have to be copacetic with a lot of different people. Yeah. Um, so I think that barring a discussion of the individual people, broad Twitter, in my opinion, and, and you know, uh, there are flaws in Angela Nangla's book because she was writing this in 2017 where it was sort of like there are parts of it that devolve into a gossip column into like, well, this is what Milo was doing and this is what Baked Alaska was doing and this is what Bronze Age Pervert was doing. So I think that to give you a general sense of what frog Twitter was, it was a true, mostly online 
rightist counterculture that was, you know, based in the socialization of the internet through meme culture and through the way that politics conforms to an aesthetic, um, what's the Heideggerian term? Comportment or activity or behavior. Okay. You know, activity is a good, you know, comportment. I'm butchering the definition, but yeah. you know, comportment is like action behavior definition. So I think that in a way, you know, and um, how should I put this? Because have you ever read the Walter Benjamin essay, uh, The Age of Art and Mechanical Reproduction? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So, you know, Benjamin was a communist and, you know, he, uh, you know, he uh, sunsetted as the Austrian painter regime was closing in. And he meant this negatively. But I think it's a good definition overall. And with the rise of Trump, uh, there was like many, many think pieces that talked about this. You know, usually from like people like that right for the Atlantic or Vox, like, you know, Ezra Klein and other people that were like more educated than the average polemicist. But they would write about how Walter Benjamin said that, you know, when it comes to the distinction between fascism and communism or Marxism, when it comes to the work of art, he said that with communism, there is a politicization of the work of art, right? You know, Soviet realism is a good example. Now, I would say that there's a whole tradition uh, before Soviet realism, like the Silver Lake, uh, Russian cosmicism, uh, pe- you know, painters like Malvich, uh, you know, because another weird eccentricity of mine is that my art history uh, background, as opposed to like, I would say the majority of the right wing is like I'm interested in 20th century uh, expressionism and abstract expressionism and basically like modernism, modern art. That's like my thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and so as opposed to what? What would oh god as opposed to like neoclassicism or okay uh you know yeah. the renaissance like i have friends who were you know very good at that but to me i always loved like the new york school the 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 what do they call them the the southwest or the uh the northwest school before the abstract expressionism uh which is painters like mark toby and morris graves who like went to Japan and other places in the forties and they like learned about, um, they learned about like literati painting and stuff like that. And, you know, like when I was, when I started doing art, like, you know, I transitioned more into like landscape painting and now I do like what I would say general expressionism, which is with figures and with, um, you know, thematic paintings. And I, I'm also a printmaker as well. But like, you know, I start off with abstract expressionism. I love the New York school, you know, and people Why? think, wow, this guy is like on the political, right? And he loves the New York school, the evil CIA artwork, <laughs> you, know? Okay. you know, like, you know, Jackson Pollock and uh, um, big fans because like Milton Resnick. Pe- and stuff. People uh, on the right wing dislike that because it's anti-aesthetic or because it's uh, because it's deteriorating or slandering yeah. uh, higher ideals. It's like non-ideal or ab- absent of ideal or anti-ideal. And Well, there's huge ideal, but it's not representation. Okay. But it's a further abstraction of what they would call... And I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth because I'm friends with some of these people. I'm, for example, I'm friends with. Uh, he was on my show, uh, Brendan Hurd, Trad Western Art. He he wrote a whole book on this, okay, about traditional Western art. And you know, we have like severe disagreements <laughs> about the work of art. Um, yeah. But I would say that the reason that the trads or the right wing gravitates to, or at least traditionally gravitated towards representation in neoclassicism, and then a lot of it was 19th century academic painting, you know, painters like Bouguereau. Right. And some of that stuff I enjoy as well. Like, like Zorn, I'm a big fan of Zorn, but, um, you know, I can't stand Bouguereau. I'm sorry. I can't, Oh, <laughs> I can't, I'm much more of an impressionism person, you know, like, uh, well, I guess Monet, but like Kobe, Cobert and, um, I really love like the ones that came after like Gauguin and Edvard Munch, you know, Edvard Munch, if you want to talk about like real OG incel art, I mean, that's Edvard Munch, right? Um, 
So, you know, and a lot of contemporary art I like as well, but a lot of contemporary art sort of like schlocky and politically driven. And yeah. I mean, all art is politically driven at the end of the day. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit Wait, that. Wait, hold on. Um, yeah. So Walter Benjamin said the difference between communist art and fascist art or aesthetic right. is... Well, oh, so sorry. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'm very sorry. Okay, okay, very, okay. I'll get to that. I'll get, I know I go in circles. I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> everywhere. Um, I'm fat guy full of energy. Okay. I'm a weirdo. Look at me. I'm a weirdo. Okay. Um, I was fatter before a few years ago. I'm trying to change. I'm changing that. I'm, I'm lifting looks weights. Maxing? Oh yeah. I'm looks maxing. You know, I, I do the intermittent fasting. I'm working out, you know, um, I was, I looked like hell. When I first started podcasting, okay, I look terrible. I still look terrible, but you know, but well, anyways, anyways, up for, up for the audience to decide. Oh, I feel way better. Yeah. yeah, I feel way better. Um, my life has changed as upon turning thirty. You know, I found a woman who loves me. Huh. Uh, I have found like a small book deal. You know, um, I I'm losing weight. Like it's it's incredible. I'm I'm getting interviewed with Benjamin Boyce. Like, come on, <laughs> you know, but uh. No, but so anyway, so a lot to answer your question, a lot of people within the right wing, they would say that it's a degradation of standards, which it was. Okay. But but in my opinion, it was responding to the bricklage of what art was the direction that art was going in the 20th century. And you can't just like ignore that. And by the time you get to Andy Warhol, now you have postmodernism. Now you have the death of the avant garde and you have this opening up of the artist that is engaging in the world on their own rather than the art movement. Because this is the theme that Andy Warhol destroyed the art movement, like the collection of artists that would come together and form a new style. The last real good one was like cubism and Dadism and abstract expressionism. Jack, you know, by the time you get to Andy Warhol and Jackson Pollock, that's gone. You know, now the artist has to, and I, listen, I'll shout him out, even though he's gotten into a little bit of trouble, but a huge foundation of my thinking around the work of art comes from John David Ebert, who wrote the book Art After Metaphysics. And like he's really one of the best resources for understanding continental philosophy outside of academia. Uh, you know, he's <laughs> had problems in his life and so forth. But to this day, I'll, I'm not ashamed to admit that John David Ebert's Art After, Metaph art After Metaphysics, that book, like, you know, changed my life. Right. Okay. So, you know, a lot of my like of this particular type of art, you know, very not the trend of what people consider the right wing in terms of the the work of art. Uh, so to answer your question, though, Walter Benjamin, he talks about how communism or Marxism or what you would call like the political left, they have a politicization towards the work of art. But the political right. And this is largely true, and, you know, even if you want to take it as a positive or a negative, most people in academia take it as a negative, of course. They would say that when it comes to the right wing, there is an aestheticization of politics, where politics becomes like the work of art in general. Now, this is how you explain frog Twitter. This is how you explain Trumpism. And yeah, this is how you also explain the Austrian painter regime, right? Not to say that there's any correlation, but well, there's a little bit, but like, I'm not going to lie. There's kind of a little bit there, but not that like, you know, people's view of history is so distorted and skewed that, yeah. you know, we're just talking about ideas here. Not to say I endorse anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm liberal. I'm liberal. No, I'm not. I'm not liberal. But like, you know, let's for, for how, just in I, case. I, any, I don't even, I don't understand yeah. how uh, one can't be liberal though. Even if you're, even if you're deeply critical of liberalism, I think the only way to exist mm -hmm. online is to be some form of liberal is to be some, some form of like open to discourse, like open wow. to having your ideas challenged open, at least partially to that so-called marketplace of ideas. Like, like you're engaging mm -hmm. with other people and you're right. not trying to enforce some sort of standard or narrow down a standard. You're, you're branching out and you're connecting and then you're kind of, I don't know. I, I don't see how you can well, be creative and mm, not be liberal. No, see, that's the problem. Though. That's no, but, but see, that's the problem is that now, if you look at history of the work of art before the 20th century, um, a lot of artists you would say are not like quote unquote liberal in the 
current mm. popular imagination, right? I think what you're talking about is, I know it's like a meme term and I don't exactly agree with like breaking everything down into like quotidians, but what does Jordan Peterson say? High openness, right? Yeah. High openness. Okay. Like now I would say that, and, and someone like Dave would give you a better answer than me, but I would say that when it comes to the popular imagination, this is like the little trick that contemporary liberalism has done is that taking its roots within the classical liberal tradition and, you know, people like Paul Godfrey talk about this way better than I can, that, you know, the original version of liberalism was sort of like high openness or rather openness to a society driven by ideas that can more or less haggle with each other. And I think that the contemporary imagination, when you say something like, well, you kind of have to be a liberal nowadays, I would say that you should divorce the ideology of the contemporary structure of liberalism with a high openness and a willingness to entertain certain ideas because the willingness to entertain certain ideas goes back to Greece. And, you know, they certainly was a different form of democracy and um, yeah. the foundation of liberal thought than what we have. Right. So um, okay. those okay. things are different, but I would say that uh, the distinction that Benjamin make is, makes is very important because and this goes to like and to reiterate that the yeah, yeah. the more communist you are the more you will politicize the work of art and the yeah. more fascist you are the more mm -hmm. you will uh, aestheticize the political yeah yeah or you would treat the political as if it was an aesthetic project yeah which you know i mean yeah that's i'm and not going to lie the that's work of art as a political project or no, rather, politics becomes a, a, an artistic project. Yeah, and then the inverse yeah. of that, the art, art becomes a political project. Yes, yes, yeah, that's what, yeah. And so, you know, Benjamin, what people don't get is that, you know, and, and there's a lot of writers on the political left who do a good job of this. There's a lot of art critics, like like um, Paul Foster and people, Donald Cusp and people like that, Arthur Danto. That would say that, you know, Benjamin, what people don't get is that he wasn't lamenting, right? He was saying that there's new possibilities within art being divorced from what he called the aura, which is like the cloud of originality of the work of art. And he said that, well, with mechanical reproduction, now we have digital reproduction, which he could have not have foreseen, but maybe he did. Who knows? Uh, there's a lot of crazy cosmic coincidences in people's writing. You know, you would say that because they're, it's divorced from the originality of the artwork. From or like the, sort the of uniqueness the, by originality, you don't mean just like novelty or freshness, no, but like the no. the isness of that one particular piece 100%, existing once. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. the isness that is wedded to the artist as genius, right? Okay. Yeah. Creating that piece of art. Walter Benjamin says that now that reproduction has divorced us from that now there's all sorts of possibilities for the political left to you know stage society in such a way and agitprop and so forth but he's saying that the regressive or reactionary tendency is to say that po politics and all of society within its root is an art project is something that can be created to the will of a, not just an ideology, but sort of like the charismatic person that comes about in times of crisis. And Walter Benjamin is saying, well, you know, the mid-century Germans were exactly that. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people in contemporary left, they say that, well, Trump, and this is where I would agree, actually, but I would say that as someone in the political right, I would say it's in the affirmative rather than the negative. Is, you know, Trumpism, which came about during the frog Twitter thing, would be like, not exactly to say Trump is like, you know, the Austrian painter, but basically he managed to take an aestheticization of political discourse to his favor through meme culture. And really, Keep Trump, it. you have to realize, you talk about frog Twitter or the frogs, the, the dissident right on online, the online right, the e-right. What was Trump before he was the president? Trump was the best poster. He was like, you couldn't get around it. Even people that hated him, you had to, like, he had a godly posting ability. Like, <laughs> like any phrase you could think of, like, um, uh, you know, Coca-Cola is upset with me. 
uh, I'll still drink that trash anyways. Like, <laughs> you know, like a, a nipples or a Barney Frank nipples protruding through his blue shirt in the Senate floor. Disgusting. Um, good, good morning. Good Christmas morning. Even to my haters and losers. Yeah. Um, like he just had a godly posting ability. And I think that Trump as a poster is what galvanized the spirit of youth culture, breaking the mold of youth culture being left wing predominantly yeah and creating a like youth okay yeah a, a right right of center to right wing version of youth culture yeah. and this is how frog twitter comes about frog twitter is the aestheticization of that political discourse through memes through edits through posting right the poster and this is what was the hippie movement and and, and you right are wing. and to anybody who's just listening in who yeah. has no idea you, there is a certain specific meaning to the word post and now, yes. now it, it comes from like posting on Twitter or just yeah. saying a statement out there, but yeah. posting it's, it's an art form and yes. there it's encrusted with liminality, with ambiguity, with a uh, poly poly polysemy or uh, multiple meanings going on. Yes. It's not just, you're not just trolling. You're also, you're not just exciting. You're not yeah. just playing to your haters. You're, you're, you're also perform. It's like, there's a performative quality to it. There's yeah. a whole, there's a whole bunch of, you could probably write a whole book on what you mean by oh people have post. i mean i'm trying to but okay you know. the post okay uh, um there's Not also weaponization to... of irony that's a big thing yeah the, the, the weaponization of irony um or what people call new sincerity or or what, what do they call yeah. it um well they used to call it new sincerity we they tried. used to call it new sincerity but now they call it like uh like there's many terms for it like i some terms are not as apt as other ones but there's sort of like you're saying something that has truth in it that you actually believe, but you're saying it in a creative way. You're saying it with a hint of irony that gives you a sort of ambiguity as to what you're meaning. Yeah. Um, there's sort of like a tongue in cheek, like you're hinting at something. And a lot of it's just to evade, to, you know, to evade censorship because the hammer really came down on us yeah. after 2016. Right. So a lot of it, and, and there's, you know, there's like, people like there's bread tubers that have whole like video essays about like what's that one guy i don't want to name them you know uh, who cares they're you know but there's some of them that talk about the alt-right quote unquote yeah. and you know the alt-right's an older term that's no longer you know uh but they would say that you know they're weaponizing irony and there's this like radicalization pipeline a lot of that's just because the poster managed to appeal to a transgressive and youthful form of people within Western civilization that have been forgotten by the culture industry that have been left behind. And so at these times of crisis, you do have an aestheticization of politics where politics becomes like an art project, similar to how the work of art becomes like posting becomes the meme, because you're trying to get at something long since the traditional work of art has quote unquote died or has become in some ways irrelevant to the popular culture or the popular imagination. Now the poster takes the mantle of trying to, what did Theodore Adorno, and again, Theodore Adorno was like, you know, one of the Frankfurt school people that the right wingers, they hate, but you know, he wrote this book called aesthetic theory. He talks about how artwork becomes autonomous. Now that artwork is no longer wedded to the patronage of say religion mm -hmm. or, even the state, now the work of art can stand outside of the social order and can pick apart its various foibles and, and hidden meanings, or yeah. even the way that we think about formulating thoughts within society, especially when it comes to politics, uh, what Deleuze called the image of thought, how you think about thinking. Yeah. The poster critiques how you think about thinking yeah. of any political issue, yeah. right? how thinking gets formulated. Yeah. And it just so happens that the E-right was good at it. You yeah. know? I mean, there's problems nowadays. Like the, there's sort of like, you know, a lack of energy for a variety of reasons. There's posters that sort of like lost the mandate of heaven, if you will. Hmm. Uh, hmm. But there's this, there was this energy around 2016. There was this movement that of these like, you know, largely millennial and Zoomer young men who were fed up, but who had a form of creativity, who couldn't make it in academia for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Maybe I'm just telling on myself, but, uh, you know, uh, but 
you know, they, they found... And, and because they were outside of that system, they didn't have to obey the rules of decorum. Such as exactly. Trump. Trump. Trump's posting was mostly, yeah. well, a large part of Trump's posting was violating decorum. And I think <laughs> that there could be a case to be made that this uh, phenomenon of Trump derangement syndrome or TDS yeah. that it infects the elite is uh, speaking to a deep um, insecurity that they have, that, that, that the culture is moving away from them, that yes. they don't have yeah. control and that all the rules that they obeyed and the forms that they took upon themselves don't mean shit. Um, right. Because they can't control it. Trump Trump leaks out of that. Yeah. A hundred percent. Now, to be totally nuanced, though, about that point, uh, you know, it, like, I agree that there. I recognize that there's limitations with that, because then the E-right themselves creates their own form of orthodoxies. And, and there's yes. sort of like. Well, that's that's the fear yeah. that the. The lurking fear like what if it does crystallize what if the right does take the reins of power will will the the creativity and the energy that that brought it there mm -hmm. be drained out by the stolid orthodoxy once it's put in place oh there's a fear with every every movement yeah that's yeah. that is one of them i'm less fearful of that i'm more fearful of you know figureheads themselves that create cults of personality around their posting around their content and then from there, it becomes very insular and focused on the inward politics of the quote unquote, you know, this thing of ours. Uh, and I think that there is a danger in that. Now, I would say, of course, we all love, we all want political power. Like, and I think Trump was a recognition to, to your point, Benjamin. Trump was a recognition that I know it like gets vulgarized, but like, let's say the Schmidt and friend enemy thing that that's a reality and that we can't go back because there's no back to go to in terms of like decorum and liberal civility and working mm. bipartisanship. Like those, all, those things are lies. They, they were, you know, they were mm. damn lies actually. Mm. And, and, you know, in, in the Republican party or like here in Canada, the conservatives, they're just as much a problem as any like liberal quote unquote elite. So I think that Trump recognized that, Maybe he didn't recognize it. Let's face it. Like a lot of things he did was very unconscious in a way. Um, yeah. Or rather the people that found meaning in Trump and Trumpism, they recognize that the politics of what we envision of like Western civilization being full of civility and discourse and a free debate of ideas, that this was not only is this no longer ser in service of people, but it was a lie to begin with and yeah. actually a form of like left liberal managerialism takes the reins and that becomes the orthodoxy and the way that they weaponize discourse that becomes uh, how you portray. How should I say it? That becomes like how you inform thinking around politics, right? You have to go behind the discourse and see how the things are formulated. Yeah. Even, even like I would even say that culture war distractions, like whether it's, I don't know, like Dylan Mulvaney or like a lot of gender war discourse, a lot of like, what's the, the recent thing, the body count thing, like those things matter in the abstract of like, okay, this is where civilization is going. But the clever trick is that when you wed yourself to these like moment to moment issues, that becomes silly. It becomes silly. To, I mean, okay, let's... What becomes silly? Well, you know, like talking the about themselves? Dylan Mulvaney and Bud Light or yeah. like... Yeah. But I would say that they, the reason they're so seductive is because they get at very deep and real political issues. But the ephemera of the quote-unquote culture war, yeah. the moment-to-moment -moment issue, yeah, whether it be like Bud Light... Or or uh, body counts of women, or, or uh, what, uh, what what standing ovation to to a Ukrainian Nazi? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, that stuff. Like it, it's red meat, right? Now it does get to a real issue, but and I talk about this in my book that's forthcoming. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it gets to a real issue, but the problem is that when you wedge yourself to like focusing on that moment to moment discourse then you have a lot of problems then you have a lot of coal then you, you're just posting coal you know you're just like you're posting inanities that we all know right like yeah. okay the, the issue about the canadian parliament okay like 
a lot of conservatives, like uh, like in Canada, a lot of like the Ezra Levant uh, rebel media types, they're like, yeah, see, like uh, the the left, they're the real Austrian painters, and don't you know that in Ukraine that they worship Bandera and yeah. all that history with the you know the war, and I would say that you know the issue is like. So people like Justin Trudeau or people that handle him, like Christia Freeland, um, who, by the way, was actually related to a top uh, advisor to Bandera, right? But and for those who don't know, Stepan Bandera was the the Austrian painter emissary in Ukraine at the time. But but then, like, I think he was even too radical for them and they sort of like kicked him out. But, you know, the, but a lot of these like far right battalions in Ukraine Stepan Bandera become, especially in Galicia, that particular part of, you know, the far right in Ukraine, you know, Bandera becomes like their symbol, right? We all know the names like Azov Battalion, Kraken Battalion, right? So, but that that's not here nor there. I, that's a whole other issue, the Ukrainian war. But the point being is that like, when it comes to Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland honoring someone who is in the Grenadier Galician SS, it becomes like this gotcha, right? But to me, and I had this telegram rant about it, to me, the real issue is not like, you know, boomer conservatives, because a lot of it's like, you know, the boomer truth regime of like, no, you're an Austrian painter. No, you're an Austrian painter, right? Oh, the real issue is that there is like a very like weird postmodern uh, reckoning of history where the past really doesn't matter. And these issues of, you know, these far right battalions in Ukraine, it's it's not the like to me, from my perspective, it's not really that they're like far right battalions in Ukraine. Who cares? Right. It's more so that all of that history becomes uh, ephemera. It becomes irrelevant because the here and now when it comes to the picture of how every like pressing geopolitical or domestic issue is treated by the liberal regime, by, by what people call the GAE, right? Uh, the global American empire, but also it means, you know, G is like, you know, you know, gay, right? The gay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's how that's global that's a homo, little, yeah. funny little, you know, trick we use. Uh, the real issue is that like, it becomes like the marvelization of discourse where like anything Ukraine is like a morally good thing because Russia is evil. And in fact, Russia is the Soviet Union, but the, the Soviet Union is now fascist instead of communist. So you have like this weird, like liberal liberalization of like the Cold War, of like Cold War politics and like the moral panic of the Red Scare. Now it's like the Brown Scare. That's the Curtis. And I'm critical of Curtis Yarvin, but like, you know, he calls it correctly, the, the Brown Scare, right? <laughs> And that like Russia is like funding global fascists and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like I've had friends who have been accused of being funded by Russia. Right. I've yeah. been accused of being funded by Russia. Like, yeah. listen, if I was, if I was Dark funded money. by Russia, I, <laughs> I, I would be living in the States right now next to my girlfriend. Okay. Like, you know, um, but the point being is that yes, it's ridiculous. It will, it will fade into irrelevancy. Nothing will happen because of course in Canada, when it comes to the state funded media, uh, Discourse is designed to terminate, especially under Justin Trudeau. So this thing is going to go nowhere. Discourse is designed to terminate. It's like a, yes. your mission, should you choose to accept it, dot, 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 this message will yeah. self-destruct in 12 seconds. So 100%. Yes. So, so, yeah, because, yeah. so during the Trekker convoy, mm -hmm. uh, a very suspicious Nazi flag can show up and get a perfect yeah. photo op of it. Yes. And then that can be used in, in the media to... to to pin those two things together. But yeah. then when the liberal Canadian parliament gives a standing ovation for an actual member of the Nazi party, or at least he used to be, right. that, that will, that won't stick. The, it, so it, the terms of thinking that hypocrisy or accusations of hypocrisy have any weight whatsoever is a yes. failed, what you would call boomer, boomer, boomer truth regime. Yeah, yeah. Boomer truth regime. It's just, it, that is yeah. not how the game is played. Yeah, well, I should point out that that's the term that academic agent uses. Uh, but it, okay. it's a good term, though. It's a good term. Because I think that the problem is that you hit the nail on the head, Benjamin. Uh, sorry, Mr. Boyce. Benjamin. Benjamin. <laughs> uh, you hit the nail on the head because the, the sort of like call of hypocrisy, that just weds you to the same culture war ephemera. It, it never goes anywhere because like you're just pointing out hypocrisy. 
yeah. to the regime, you know, uh, and I think even Dave said this on your show, like to the regime, like hypocrisy doesn't matter at the end of the day, because when you control the way in which um, not only do people filter news, but the way that people fundamentally filter their beliefs around politics, then it's not really hypocrisy to them. To them, it's honoring a Ukrainian hero because now there's sort of like, like I said, a marvelization, which is like a very clear cut, kitchified, yeah. you know, my book's really about kitsch. That's the whole point. My book's called Neoliberal Kitsch, are in the 21st century. Um, there's sort of like a kitschification of discourse where there's a very stark, you know, we're, we're all aware of it. We're all aware, but we're aware that we're enjoying it. Yeah. And we find meaning in, in sort of like moral supply in yeah. enjoying it. Okay. And so when Justin Trudeau does it, like he really doesn't know. Does he know anything? Right? Like yeah. maybe Christia Freeland does. She's a bit smarter than he is. But in the end of the day, it's not really about the hypocrisy of it. That's irrelevant. It's more so the humiliation ritual of the fact that they can do this, but yet they can like, and by the way, you know, that photo you were talking about with the trucker convoy, yeah. you know, who took that photo? The, he just so happened to be there. The, the Justin Trudeau's official photographer yeah. just so happened to be there yeah. in that moment. Right. Very suspicious, but even still, I mean, these things you can't prove, right. I mean, you can have like, yeah. you know, people always talk about rallies. But you do how, know that if there's one Nazi at the dinner table, you, you, you're at a Nazi dinner party. Yeah. I mean, right. that's the, that's the, the discursive. One drop rule. Yeah. yeah. The one drop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's it, it, what people talked about, like, this is how like, you know, Canadian liberals, which are kind of like unique from the American ones. They're, I don't know. They, I, how do I describe that? There's no balance to your country. Yeah. There's no, there's no Trumpism no. at all. So there's no counter to it. Like they have complete free reign yeah. to basically to do anything yeah do anything like they can freeze your bank account like china mm -hmm. and then talk about totality and then denounce totalitarianism in the same yeah session but also the character of canadian lips they're different in that okay they're not mm -hmm. different they're as much as we hate america because america is jesus land and you no know, america is all that's wrong with the world right <laughs> we're, we're, we're land of chud yeah. Yeah, the land of the Chud, Chudville? right? Chudville, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. America's Chudsville, right? Um, as much as America's Chudsville, like we still are, like the history of Canada, we're still royalist subjects. But now the empire is different, right? So what I describe the Canadian lib is that when they talk, there's, I hate to say it, maybe I'm just, um, it's sour grapes, but like they tend to be a bit like more, um, how shall I say it? monosyllabic in their thinking as opposed to the American lips in mm -hmm. that like they'll repeat the same things over and over again um, they always like they have very boomerish tendencies of like thinking where they'll have like the, the they all have the same like Canadian flag next to the rainbow flag next to the Ukrainian flag next to like um, five times needle which means like five times uh, yeah. sacramented as we yeah. called it during during the Kavidian era. Um, so like they have a, like similar thinking patterns. And, and the, nowadays, you know what the new upgrade is? The new upgrade is Canada. This is their profile picture. Canada as a, the new trans gay flat, the LGBTQ plus blah, 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 I, I, however yeah. Justin Trudeau spells it. That flag with like the V in, in on top of Canada that says hate has no home here. That's like the new update, right? Um, yeah. so th this was during the parent rally. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, for the record, Benjamin, I've never been to any of these rallies because frankly, I'm paranoid. Uh, <laughs> I've had relatives and friends who have been to the trucker thing, but you know, my, yeah. me myself, I'm in my basement. So, you know, I'm a basement dollar. I'm yeah, a we can see the window right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, so Canadian liberals, I like to say that they're the bluest of blue state Democrats. Because and they have seen, no irony. Yeah. There's no, no ironic. No, no, turn, no. Whatsoever. It's, it's very earnest. Yes, 100%. Yeah, okay. They're like robots in a way. No, I know. I shouldn't say. I shouldn't dehumanize them that way. But well, when I, I said they're got kind a little of like NPC robots. going on. We're, we're all running scripts. We're all running Oh, scripts. yeah, exactly. 100%. Yeah. But I would say that like American, like, you know, the American leftoid, they can have irony. They can sort of like, 
engage with the right wing in more creative ways. But I always say that the Canadian liberal is sort of like the bluest of blue state Democrat, because as much as they hate Canada, they still have the same like moral panic and culture war issues that their Democrat superiors in America has. Yeah. So, for example, um, I, I talked about this with Orrin McIntyre, right? Like, uh, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the indigenous issues, but, you know, during the summer at Floyd, you have the quote unquote mass graves thing. It's like, well, it is our like spiritual metaphysical legacy of oppression. And what happened? Well, it's a justification for self hatred. Yeah. And then for some reason, church is burned. Yeah. So, you know, but, but, but that was an American culture war template yeah. that was then taken by the Canadian liberal and by Justin Trudeau. And they, they need that yeah. in order to sync up with the political energy that's just emanating off of America. Yeah, because it's impossible. If you're a Canadian, any sort of political energy inevitably comes here because it's just by virtue of it. Because we're imperial subjects, right? So yeah. we're the closest. We are the closest on the totem pole of the empire. We're And, and yeah. the thing is, uh, you know, can't, and people, you want a great writer. Um, a great writer that talked about this, that predicted a lot of this, was George Grant. Um, in, in the 50s, he wrote Lament for a Nation. And he talked about the Americanization of Canada. And there, there was a time where the political left and the political right in Canada even could have differentiated themselves. But after the 60s, after just, no, sorry, not just, I, my, my mind is mixed up. After his father, Pierre Trudeau, those possibilities were gone. Okay. Maybe in Quebec a little bit because they're sufficiently different with their language and their identity. But ultimately, when it comes to what we call Anglophone Canada, as opposed to Francophone Canada, there was this rampant liberalization and Americanization that happened under his father or, well, some people say stepfather, but like, who knows, right? Uh, Justin uh, Pierre Trudeau. Uh, so, you know, and I'm butchering it, of course, there's a lot of history that has went into that. But George Grant, more or less, and, you know, he predicted, he said, well, Canada used to have a tradition of, you know, when it comes to political right, Canada used to have a tradition of high Toryism, which is kind of like the wedding of social conservatism with what people call economic, quote unquote, liberalism. Right. But, you know, after Pierre Trudeau and especially after Brian Mulroney in the 80s, you know, the Canadian conservative party, I mean, they're they're more like uh, what do you call in America rhinos right like they're they're like neoliberal they're like neocons and neoliberals yeah, yeah. pretty much right so uh, and you know as much as I think like Stephen Harper was a quintessential manager and 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 did do a lot of prudent economic decisions especially during two thousand eight you know at the end of the day like Stephen Harper like people like in in Canada uh, like the libs they like go crazy about him to this day but it's like he really you know, like he basically destroyed the reform, like the Western Reform Party social conservatism element within the federal conservative party. So it's like, uh, yeah, Stephen Harper was an extension of that from Brian Mulroney onwards, right? So now there, Canada, yeah, we're just now Americans Canada. pretty much. Is, yeah, <laughs> is there any predictive um, capacity of like where Canada is going or like if, if Canada mm. really is the highest one on the totem pole, does that show us what the regime really wants? Does that like show yeah. us like Canada and New Zealand maybe are the, are the, you know, they're, they're the manifestation of what people are uh, wondering what the WEF wants, whatever, maybe, maybe California too, but Canada is yeah. like, doesn't have any opposition. So it just goes along with the marching orders that are emanating from that shadowy yeah. cabal or that emergent managerial um, uh, intention or will. Well, Canada was always the testing ground. Um, you know, people don't know this, but a lot of culture war issues that were, that are being fought in America, they originated in Canada. Um, now there was this whole like pipeline of uh, hmm. like, you know, normie, um, what we like to call alt light back in the day influencers, you know, people like Gavin McGinnis and Lauren Southern and like, and all of them, yeah, they, okay. they started off with Ezra Levan. You know, he was the one that like fed them to America because if you're like to the right of Justin Trudeau, you go to America. Like I have largely an American audience. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that like, for example, 
way before the freedom of speech thing happened. It was happening in Canada with like, you know, Ezra Levant and the Human Rights Commission. And, you know, listen, I'm a critic of Ezra Levant, but at the time, uh, you know, the whole thing where he was filming the human rights trial and Mark Stein with the, uh, well, with Ezra Levant, it was the Muhammad cartoons. Now I'm, I'm critical of like the anti-Muslim thing, obviously in, in North America, in Europe, it's way different, but like in North America, the, like an, the anti-Muslim thing was sort of like, you know, overplayed, but in Europe, it's a real issue with the migrant crisis and so forth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, Ezra Levant, he was, you know, crucified for, uh, and like, you know, Kurt Vestigard, I believe he took an interview here in Canada who did the Muhammad cartoons. And then Mark Stein was uh, brought up when he wrote America Alone. Um, I read that when I was like 13 years old, you know. I mean, nowadays I see the limitations of it. I think that, you know, Mark Stein is really, they still have like a fundamentally like neocon view of a lot of these issues. But, you know, at the time it was like uh, it was fresh, you know, it was like, well, this was going to happen. So I think, like, you know, when it comes to freedom of speech issues that happened in America, you know, post-Gamergate, like, like a lot of this stuff originated in Canada. Um, but I would say, to answer your question, what happened, you know, it's funny you answer this question because, ask this question, because recently there was this, like, meeting of, like, global progressive uh, leaders or whatever, and it was Justin Trudeau, and it was, uh, what's her name? From the, New Zealand. Of Jakinda, he... Jakinda Arden. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the and, and get, yeah. Um and who who else was there? Oh yeah, yeah. This is the scary part. This is the scary part. You know who else was there? Uh the uh, Tony Blair was was at this oh. meeting. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he was like there next to Justin Trudeau and the Prime Minister of Australia and the Prime Minister of New Oh, well, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jakinda Arden, uh, who, you know, during COVID you know, turn New Zealand once again into a prison island. Uh, so, you know, and they were talking about, and I remember Justin Trudeau, she, he tweeted out um, uh, this thing where he's like, we're going to fulfill progressive aims while fighting climate change, while making living more affordable, while making groceries less expensive. And I'm thinking like, okay, you know, like I, back in the day, I, I, you know, to this day, I still entertain a lot of like uh, ecological thinking, right? I'm thinking like, okay, from the perspective of environmentalism, how can you lower the cost of living while fighting climate change, while instantiating whatever nebulous term that is progressive social policy which really just means censoring freedom of speech which means that you know we have to go after the chuds and the radicalization pipeline and you know trudeau with his new uh canadian content bill that what's it called bill c18 or whatever yeah uh, and who knows maybe i will get promoted because i'm canadian content nah not really i'm not, i'm not gonna get the trudeau canadian content bucks anytime <laughs> soon let me tell you right so it's very interesting that you ask this on the heels of this meeting, and of course, with the whole thing where Zelensky, so oh, for YouTube, sorry, um, Elensky coming to Ottawa and honoring this uh, grenadier, um, you know, Galician Waffen SS officer, right? Like all of these things, they are, and, and of course, the Sikh issue. This uh, another thing recently, me and Prude talked about this uh, last week. Like it's it's sufficiently away from washington but it's within the the galaxy of washington okay and i mean they're only like what um six seven eight eight ten hours away from each other ottawa and washington right? yeah. so and what's that uh, telling maybe, us then what, if there's a predictive power oh 100 percent. yeah yeah no you hit the nail on the head there is a yeah there's a predictive staging that happens in these other anglosphere countries and now britain i hate to say it is also one of them uh, because in in a lot of ways, like the 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 things that are happening in Britain, they're worse than Canada, and like, uh, hard to believe. But they recently passed. I, there's British friends of ours that are, that are content creators that might get affected. You know, like Morgoth and uh, Tom Roswell. You know, survive the jive. Uh, like just off the top of my head, right? Like th these people, they're in serious danger right now because of this online hate speech bill that got passed. So in America. What's interesting is that Canada, you, you, the future of Canada, and now this is a Canada stream. We, we forgot to talk about the work of art, but we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, 
Sorry, when I get when I get excited, I talk a lot. So you know, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> that's what my show is for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, let me calm down a little bit. Uh, okay, so Canada, right? When it comes to the future of Canada, Canada has a lot of population and housing problems and, and economic problems because remember, we avoided two thousand eight, but we kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit, right? Not a little bit, a lot. So when it comes to like the fact that if you're a millennial like myself, or if you're a Zoomer especially, um, you'll never be able to afford a home ever, yeah. right? Um, or you'll have to live in some quasi-communal living like a lot of these migrants that Trudeau brings in does, the, the way they do. In Europe, the housing market, I mean, that's a sealed deal, you know, economically. And I have European friends that tell me. And so Canada, I think has two options. Canada can become kind of like a smaller European country where like, you know, there's tourism, uh, you know, there's sort of like um, back in the day, back in the 1950s, there was this great interview with Marshall McLuhan in, in the CBC, our state broadcaster. And people don't, a lot of people don't know this, but Marshall McLuhan's Canadian. Well, it was Canadian. He unfortunately passed away. Uh, you know, the great media theorist, the, you know, you have to study Marshall McLuhan if you want to know what's going on, right? With, with the media and, and the communications. Yeah. Uh, he said this, he had this brilliant interview where he said that Canada has an option to view life from the slow lane, that we are largely a, a agrarian population that could, oh, at the time anyways, uh, that could just basically opt out of the machinations of yeah you know, the global empire, right? Like the, I mean, he was referring to America even at that time, but Canada being like a large, the urban population now has two options. You can either recognize that you're kind of like a smaller European country with a huge landmass, And you could, uh, you know, you could like revamp social institutions like universal healthcare. You could limit immigration uh, you, you know, you could kick a lot of them out. Uh, you know, you can realize that there's certain problems with the way that housing is connected to immigration, with the way that Trudeau has handled things. You can say that, you know, Canada, we cannot afford to be America light, in other words. Or you have just acceleration of the same, which is like, we hate America, but we're kind of like America light. And we can be a player on the world stage and we can have this. And a lot of Canadian, especially a lot of Canadian liberals, they have this like monumental delusion that what they say matters, that because we're so close to the American media empire that we can like, you know, we're the like moral. And this is the language, by the way, that they were using about Trudeau during Trump, where it's like, well, America is becoming like this evil isolationist fascist state under Trump. Therefore, Canada can become like the voice of moral authority hmm. on like the global, like rules based international order. Right. So I think those delusions are very dangerous because it doesn't factor into the massive amounts of problems Canadians have as opposed to even Americans. Now, America has an immigration crisis as well, but America is a nation of 400 million, 400 million or 500 million people. 400 uh, million people. Are we at 400 yet? Yeah. Is it already I mean, well, up? Three, three, the three, real three. numbers is sort of, yeah. you know, it's funny, but Let's see, uh, like, yeah, 400 million people. Okay. So, um, with that in mind, if Canada is kind of the paragon of what the global empire is promising, Mm -hmm. Or at least like, like, it just seems like it's just doing all this weird stuff with Trudeau. You're like, how can you get away with it? They get away with it because they can get away with it. And they're going to continue to get away with it. Yeah. Um, and then going back to what you're talking about with frog Twitter or with the aestheticization of politics, is there any room? Can it also be a playground for these right, rightish wingish or this counter um, regime aesthetic to take hold and to have, or do we get to see how it doesn't connect to power yeah. at all? Can it connect to power? Can you hook frog Twitter up to power? Oh, well, oh, that's a million dollar question. Uh, in Canada, I think that, you know, there's a lot of very well-funded um, leftist activist groups uh, that I will not name, but you know, they, they have this theory that there's like this pipeline, um, 
of like, you know, dark right wing American money coming into Canada. And I think a lot of this is because when you're a Canadian, you need American like either conservatives or people on the right to like signal boost you just by by virtue of it. Right. And it's like, for, for example, me, like I'm a Canadian, but, you know, I'm friends with people in America who are on the political right and they invite me on to shows like Warren McIntyre. You know, he invites me on his show because we're friends. And, you know, there's no there's no like exchange of dark money going on. I wish I wish. Um, but <laughs> but no. So I think like things happen more organically. But I think that a lot of Americans on the political right, they look to Canada and they look to their friends in Canada and they say like, well, look what's happening. That's going to happen here and it will happen there. OK, like, you know, that line in The Simpsons, I know this term painfully millennial, but you know, the line in the Abe, Abe Simpson, grandpa, where, you know, Homer has a flashback to him and Barney listening to Queen in their room. He's like, I used to be with it. Then they changed what it was. It'll happen yeah. to you. <laughs> and lo and behold, like Lisa and Bart, they're listening to the Smashing Pumpkins and, and Homer is like, oh, God, that's even a dated reference. now, <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins. Um, yeah. Oh, Billy Corgan's pretty based, by the way. But, uh, you know, like, and Homer's like, oh, my God, it happened to me. My kids listen to this strange music that I can't comprehend. So the point being is that Americans, they're like, well, it can happen to you, right? And it will happen to you. Um, so I think that when it comes to uh, the aesthetics of rightist culture war frog transgression, there's been attempts. And in some ways, the convoy was sort of like that, Right. But the convoy was much more of like an innocent attempt at it that was immediately crushed. But it has created, I think, an effective template of protest against a managerial regime, which is through stasis, which is through the grinding down of vital services in a passive and peaceful way. Now, there's been people that talk about this incident in Coots and this gun charge and how they're trying to say that the truckers because they pushed some protester that they were violent like the media the cbc and well cbc actually there's canadian outlets that are worse than the cbc there's like the ctv they're trying mm. to like outlive them right outwoke them i hate that term woke but mm. you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so the point being is that like it doesn't matter when it comes to you know when it comes to having control over that media apparatus like you know you could create any story you want about truckers. And and let's face it, like, listen, let me be totally objective and say that were there some weirdos involved with the truckers? Yes. Were there some like, you know, schizo posters involved that had like illusions of grandeur? Yes. But I think, you know, the trucker I wrote, or I wrote about the time I wrote this, uh, you should check out this book. It was a um, compilation of essays by my good friend, Bill Marchant that was published by terror house press it's called uh ending bigly a the many fates of trudeau now most people wrote short stories that were kind of funny about how like canada would you know how canada would become the future but i wrote the only non-fiction essay where i talk about the truckers and i say you know when you look at it like it is sort of like a, a new model of protest movement and um even though it's like pretty on optical, I compared it in some ways to the Iranian revolution <laughs> because in Iran, what you had was, and again, I'm not endorsing the Iranian, I'm not endorsing the Iranian revolution. I'm saying that like, um, ironically enough, the godfather of critical theory, the godfather of queer theory, Michel Foucault was a journalist in Iran at the time. And this guy who, you know, who was games, I mean, he died of, you know, um, and I wrote I wrote a lot about Michel Foucault in grad school. I, again, another thing that sets me apart from the right wing. Yeah. And listen, before I move on, let me say that I do not endorse Foucault's personal life. I do not endorse the allegations of what he may or may have done in Tunisia. OK, so let's let's get that out of the way. You have to separate the ideas from the person. Right. I do not endorse a lot of what Michel Foucault thought or behaved. So let me just mm -hmm. get, you know, the allegation, I'm assuming you know about them, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. About the Tunisia. So, but Michel Foucault, he wrote this book where he like uh, talked about the Iranian revolution. Now, of course, you know, he later on admitted that, like, listen, these are terrible theocrats that probably want to, you know, they would throw me off a building. Or but he said, oh yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, at the time he said that when it comes to the Iranian revolution, um, 
and again, not like, let me say that most right wingers do not talk about this, right? They're, most right wingers do not endorse Iran. So I'm just saying this purely theoretically. He wrote about how the constant, never ending protest that comes from a tradition outside of Western liberal revolution, the French Revolution in particular. He said that it comes from Islam, it comes from their faith, it comes from a source that is non political. But then becomes political, and and you know so I said my, G- so he's comparing yeah. jihad to um, revolutionary uh, liberalism. Well, the particular form of revolutionary Islamic politics in Iran under Ayatollah Khomeini, where people were organizing under a central figure, there was never ending protest. Like like protest became a way of life. That was different than the revolutionary politics of say France in you know in in the mm. French Revolution. So and or then of the course 60s Foucault across the or West. yeah or you know and Foucault was involved in that he was he was up there with his students throwing bricks at police officers in sixty eight right yeah. so Foucault said you know basically they come up with a protest movement that was different than the Western tradition and he found that very sexy and romantic and then later on he's like well maybe I shouldn't have done that and there's a lot of like great feminist critics of Foucault that talk about it how like well you know Foucault you're endorsing like a terrible theocracy that oppresses women and and LGBT people and so forth and but the reason I compared the two is because it's not that they're the same like the people that were in the trucker protest they're not like theocrats they're just like normal people Right. Like they're like a lot of Sikh truck drivers were in the protests. Right. Mm -hmm. But the reason I compare it is because what would you how do you think about a protest movement that is a part of everyday life? Right. That is a part of the economy. That is a because in Canada, people like even more than so than America, because of our huge geographic distance, trucking is a vital industry. I mean, Canadian society cannot function without it. It cannot function without the railroad. I mean, Canada was built upon the CPR, the the Canadian Pacific Railway. And and trucking is massively important, right? So, you know, a lot of people in the trucker protest, they were just like normal people. They weren't theocratic. They weren't even necessarily right wing. But how do you come up with a model that isn't the, you know, typical revolutionary liberalism? of say the French revolution onwards, because that comes with limitations. Like, and you know, I think even distributors talked about this a lot of like, this is like common parlance among reaction, like neo reaction, right? Is that, you know, every social revolution from the French revolution, right up until the civil rights movement, they were endorsed by elites more or less. And and so the, the sort of theory that you get in school and civics class is that, you know, people come together organically and they protest power and they try to like, you know, they try to like protest for their rights. And it's this very like wholesome chungus thing. Right. But really, uh, reality does not work that way. But I would say the trucker movement, it was organic and there were certain elements that probably tried to use it to their advantage. And it was being signal boosted by America for obvious reasons. But I would say that, you know, it did create an alternative model of protest. That was my argument. That's why I bring up the Iranian revolution. Not to say they're the same. Well, totally we, can, different. we yeah. can compare and contrast it to the summer of Floyd, right? Oh, so some summer of Floyd, you, you have yeah. Antifa, you, you have basically a whole bunch of white people fighting for black uh, liberation by going to black yeah. areas and burning them all down. And yeah. then the uh, elite going through and giving a bunch of money to, to get those people out of jail or just like turning, mm-hmm. turning them back loose, not really prosecuting these people at all. That's, yeah, and defunding uh, that's police a, and so forth. it's a model of revolution that works in favor of the regime. Like what happened yes. at uh, the Evergreen state college, which was a perfect encapsulation of that, which is where I came from. It was oh, yeah. that right. the, the students took over, they did all the hostage and, and then the, the powers that be just bowed down to them, gave them whatever they want, and then used that to institute more yeah, DEI yeah. principles and, and restrict academic speech. Yeah. Uh, even further. So it worked in the favor in the long term, even though it a bit embarrassed that institution and it yeah. uh, irrevocably um, ruined its reputation. Um, 
that is one model of protest that is has a through line through the um, civil rights era and mm-hmm. all the way back to the French Revolution. The trucker yeah. protest was by people who aren't going around burning down things and they're not trying to, they just, what, what, what do they want and how are they going about getting what they want? And does the regime cat girl Kulak has this essay that, that says that mm-hmm. the trucker protest did get everything that they want. Like immediately after that, they, uh, all yeah. the, the demands were basically met. And despite, um, the government for some reason showing their hand and, and restricting bank accounts, which, delegitimizes banking, which is a huge yeah. risk. Why would they take such a huge risk on that? But maybe they think that they can just get away with anything. Despite mm-hmm. that, it seems like Canada said, okay, well, we can't quite go totally far. The, like the the 2020, the response to the pestilence of 2020 yeah. with the lockdownerism and the mandates of the vaccines, they couldn't go as far as they wanted, but they did show their hand that they do want to go this far. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And the trucker protest was showing that there is a stop to that or there is a counter to that that's viable. It's hard to say because I'm looking at it objectively, not not just being a fan of it. Right. Um, yeah. Well, that's a great question, Benjamin, uh, because like, OK, so the reason I bring up Iran and the reason that you brought up the summer of Floyd is that we're looking at things objectively from the standpoint of an ac- say an academic would or a sociologist yeah. and we don't really endorse we're not endorsing anything i'm not endorsing the iranian revolution but i'm saying it's an interesting model the way that also the moral panic of the summer of floyd was right now when it comes to the effectiveness i would admit now there's this great essay by uh I, I forget her name, but she's a writer in the National Post, which is like the right of center, right liberal newspaper in Canada. Yeah. Uh, she wrote this essay on her Substack. What's her name? Um, Barbara Kay? Would it be? Let's no, but Barbara, Barbara Kay, she wrote another one, but this is another writer. She's, uh, I think she's Bangladeshi or Indian or something. I forget. Uh, but she's a good writer. She wrote this essay on her Substack called What Do the Truckers Want? If you just like Google search it, Google search yeah. Substack, what do the truckers want? And she interviewed a bunch of them in Ottawa. And, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of the demands were sort of nebulous. They were, they came out of, and this was my criticism as well in my essay, is that um, a lot of the demands were like kind of abstract and they were situated within a general malaise and frustration of the lockdown and uh, jab measures in Canada at the time. And so a lot of the demands, and yes, I will admit as embarrassing as it is, a lot of like the truckers, they had like very like American assumptions about things like protesting and civil rights and freedom of speech. And yeah, so I am, I fully admit the like the demands were, were very like modeled and they were based on sentiment, but there was the real objective demand of we know after three years, because you have to remember in Canada, it was almost three years. I couldn't travel across the border, you know, because I chose not to, uh, you know, I, I like to think that my principles won out, by the way, <laughs> my choice of not getting a certain uh, medical procedure uh, repeatedly. So, uh, you know, in Canada, we were hit way harder with the managerial liberal response to a biosecurity issue. Mm-hmm. That became, it was a biopolitical issue of the administering of health and life that became moral panic. That was sold as a quasi-secular religious obligation to, to like, you know, that you're harming people and that you're this like, you know, you are a moral contagion if you don't go along with it. So but, uh, Trudeau said you're yeah. basically a bunch of racist, sexist, yes. homophobes. I'm probably sexist. Probably transphobe. I remember that speech. Yeah. And it's funny because the, the Toronto Star, which is the largest newspaper in Canada, it's only large because people like it's in every like, you know, Tim Hortons coffee shop. It's in every yeah. doctor's office. Right. They had this insane and they would ne- like not even America, like not even the New York Times would publish this. They had this like insane, of course, anonymous, like wall of comments by people, quote unquote, their readers that said that I hope people that don't take the jab die. They deserve it. 
they deserve the ventilator. It was like, you can look this up and they had to like retract this, this piece about like, this is what our readers are saying about people who don't choose to take the, 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 the sacrament. And it was like this insane humiliation ritual where they were like, people should die and they deserve it. And they deserve to be, you know, to, to be like, this is eugenical, right? Oh, sorry. You can't say, oh, you, you know, you can't say in YouTube, the E word, right? It was like, you know, this is like, this is like a form of like nor- normie sadism, right? Against people mm-hmm. that choose not to take the medical procedure. Um, and, and so like, that was the climate in Canada. Now, do people go way too far in the other side where it's like, you know, they have this thing where everyone you know, that, that has a heart attack, they're like, oh, died suddenly, right? Like, oh, yeah. oh, uh, yeah. vaxxed, right? Even, um, you know, even I saw this thing with uh, the guy from Chapo Trap House who unfortunately had a a, a medical issue recently. They're like, oh, vaxxed, right? <laughs> like, it's, yeah. I understand, like, that becomes a meme and, like, there's people that, like, are genuine, like, schizos that take it too far. But, you know, I do think that the questioning of this mass medical procedure was totally silenced. And now after the lockdowns are lifted, now it's like, you know, you won't be immediately banned even on YouTube for, for saying it, even when the damage is done. Now it's like, okay, people that we used to ban, um, you know, back before like Elon controlled Twitter, it's like, you know, you get, ba- I, I used, I used to say sacrament. I didn't say jab or I didn't say vax. Mm-hmm. I said sacrament. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, it's like a clever little, thing right um but no but it's like that was the environment that the average canadian was under was that you were told that you were a second class citizen that you were a particular moral contagion against the body of the sort of like wholesome chungus democratic quote-unquote liberalism that canada was founded upon the state ideology of like multiculturalism and so forth so like the, the trucker thing came out of that sentiment and a lot of the conditions by which they there were demands they were confused and and they were muddled but when it comes to the effectiveness of it now it is true that they did get what they want but i you know to be totally objective and even though i'm a fan of the truckers right but i'm being objective i'm putting my academic hat on right i would say that (laughs) i would say that it was partially the truckers but it was partially because the reality of those measures could not have existed beyond three years. It just, it couldn't have like, in, in fact, what was even crazier and people don't know this is that when it comes to cross border travel, which by the way, to go like a Canadian going to America is like not a big deal. It's like not a trip because we do it all the time. Uh, you know, I go to America all the time now, right? Cause my, my GF lives in America. So, um, so like Canada, we have this like brother relationship with America. We like to deny it, but it's true. What people don't know is that Trudeau let us out quicker than Biden letting us in because the travel bans from Amer- in America, they, they like the, the, the jab, you know, restrictions, um, they existed way longer than even Trudeau's. Well, that was crazy. That's okay. crazy. Like you could fly to Europe or you could fly to um, South America. You you know, you could fly to um, Asia after a certain point, like, but America didn't let us in, right? So there was an extension by the Biden administration even harsher than Trudeau's measures. Do you think that was and um, I like to th- retaliatory yeah. to the truckers? It could have been. It could have been. But I, I maybe I think because the the truckers created sufficient social pressure upon quote unquote health experts in Canada. But also I think maybe it just it goes to like the particular lethargy. Not not that there was a conscious decision, but I think it goes to the fact that Biden had kind of like while well, that's starting to slip away a little bit as people within the Pentagon, not the State Department, are more critical of the funding of ukraine i think it goes towards the sort of like pig-headedness of the biden administration but also the lethargy of the managerial state under biden that Mm -hmm. probably like i don't want to describe again even though i'm like a terrible right winger i don't want to describe like complete malice upon people yeah but 
I, I just think that it was a weird coincidence that Biden had travel restrictions even longer than Justin Trudeau. Yeah. But the ones that Justin Trudeau implemented were way harsher because they had central control because Canadian federalism, you have to realize when it comes to resist and this is for a little history lesson. This is, this is a little civics lesson for Americans. Okay. Now when there's what they call residual powers where, and in Canada we have a constitution, but we have the, the, you know, the charter of rights and freedoms, uh, but the original constitution that was signed in Britain, we we have that, right? And then Trudeau Sr. created the Bill of Rights and Freedoms, blah, blah, blah. Um, again, I'm butchering it. But in Canada, the tradition that comes from Britain, by the way, um, it, and even in, in France, uh, you know, coming from France into Quebec, the tradition was largely European when it comes to, quote unquote, residual powers, which were issues that were not enumerated in the official documents, the precedent was always that the federal state handles those, right? Now, healthcare is administered by provinces, but there's still like federal healthcare funding. It's it's complicated. But the point being is that there's any residual issues politically, it gets handled by the federal government. More or less, that's the precedent. That's the tradition that has come down from us from Britain and France and so forth. But in America, as you know, you're an American, Benjamin. Um, the residual powers tends to be handled by the state. I'm more, I'm not an American. You can correct me on this, but more or less the state issues are there because it's like, if anything, the federal government can't handle it, it reverts like in terms of legal precedent and the constitution of America, it reverts to the states, right? Like, so healthcare, for instance, that's one, mm -hmm. um, the administration of certain contraband, like, you know, you can have weed in like Denver and New York, but like in southern states, it's like more restricted. Uh, but I believe in Texas, you can have like a quote unquote medical exception that they can, you know, hand out like candy. But of course, in Canada, it's it's a federal issue. Marijuana is not enumerated in any like legal precedent. So therefore, it becomes a federal issue. And of course, that's how Trudeau partially got elected back eight years ago was like, you know, the dude weed thing. So that's one example. So travel is handled, I believe, by the federal government in more or less in both, both countries, right? So, I, I mean, state by state, like interstate travel is regulated by states. But correct me if I'm wrong, is travel in terms of international travel, that's obviously handled by the federal government in America? I guess TSA and, yeah, those yeah. are federal. Yeah. In Canada, it's similar. So, uh, you know, so, but the reason I bring this up, the civics lesson is because the attitude of governance in Canada is different than America. There's no like real, like uh, there kind of is, there kind of is, but not in the same way in America where there's like provincial rights, right? I mean, Canada in some ways is even more regionalistic than America in terms of like the uniqueness of each, you know, each province. But in, in terms of like American discourse around political rights, there's this big thing about like state, especially in the political right. There's like this big thing about states' rights and enumerated powers of the states. Canada, from its very inception, back before we were an independent nation, when we were loyalists, we, you know, we existed within the legal British tradition, where like the whole states' rights thing was, or the provincial rights thing, that wasn't very much of a concern. Like, I'll give you another example. This is, I know this is a very quick example. But, okay, you know in America, there's something about the soul of America, which is about the Turner thesis, the frontier. The mm. Like, America always closes a frontier, but Americans always explore a frontier. That then gets closed, right? Now, in America, you had the West, you had parts of Mexico, um, you had the, the sort of like the romantic image of the cowboy, of, of the, the panhandler, right? Yeah. Um, so order in America comes after this like rebel anarchic exploration and the romanticism that's attached to it. That's America. Like that's a soul, like even Bojer talked about this when he traveled to America in the 80s. He had this book called America, which is like a travel log. It's like a theory cell travel log. Great book. I, I'm a big fan of Bojer. Uh, so America is the open plain. It's the highway. It's the exploring of the cowboy. But then the frontier gets closed. The state comes in. Okay. Now, Canada, we had a frontier as well in the north. 
But the difference was that the order of the state, the Mounties, they came in first to survey. They regulated the gold panhandlers, the, the gold um, the gold miners. They made sure that um, they had sufficient equipment and supplies in, in company you know, company villages that were adjacent in places like the Yukon, right? So Canada is the tradition of order coming first. The frontier is closed as opposed to America. America, it's always this romance of like, we're opening a frontier and then we close it, right? Canada has the opposite of that because we are a loyalist country originally to Britain and now to America, so that that was my civil that was my civics class, um, but I think like the reason I talk about this is because I think that Americans they sort of still don't understand why Canada is the way it is, and I think it's there's something spiritual there. There's a spirit, and, and maybe I'm romanticizing it a little, a little too much because then you know critical theorists would say that well that also entailed racism and slavery and so forth, and and even here in Canada that entailed the subjugation of the indigenous population. But I would say a romantic view would, is that America is a frontier country. It is a new country that breaks off from the old world, then breaks off from civilization. And America always like worshiped the rugged individual conquering and surveying the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then that gets closed in. Canada was always in some ways we always had the spirit of order. Like, okay, look, just look at the, the, the saying on the Constitution of America. Peace, no, not peace, what is it? Um, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, right? Like, those are, like, individualistic, and they're, like, you know, do what you want. Not do what you want, but, like, create for yourself something. Yeah. Canada, our saying, is peace, order, and good governance. Okay, yeah. So there's something within the spirit of Canada that I think is different than America. But now that we become Americanized, we become Americanized with a quote unquote newer version of America that is kind of contrary to that original, like, you know, gunslinger, explorer, cowboy, frontiersman. Right. Yeah. So you guys are going to default towards the managerial. Uh, oh yeah, tough, hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So, so any sort of rebellion against that mm -hmm. is going to be orderly or already easily subsumed by the order. Like, there's a passivity yeah. to it. Well, well, there's a passivity to it because I think, like most Canadians, I mean, I don't speak for everybody, of course, but I think like there's something within a lot of Canadians that that view it as like an affront of, of a sort of like mild mannered character of the way things work in Canada, that there is no like grand and bloody revolutions yeah. that we are not, we are subject instead of like, even from our founding, we asked the British to like be independent. There was no like bloody violent revolution. America has this like, even like even leftist Americans have that you know kind of like a version of that, right? Yeah. Can Canadians they they were always sort of like an acquiescent, like largely agrarian until recently, largely agrarian population that had just a different. I wouldn't call it biosphere, maybe biosphere, but like I know that's a problematic term, but like let's say a national character to Canadians because of our history and because of the way the British treated us that you know we were sort of like uh we were always meant to kind of be like a demure loyalist population now there's parts of Can of Can there's a spirit in canada that for example i think is embodied in the work of art like the group of seven approximates the conquering of the landscape in my group opinion. of seven yeah yeah the, the i mean as an artist in canada you know you live under the group of seven landscape painters even people that were like adjacent to them, like Emily Carr. I'm a big fan of Emily Carr. Uh, but of course, nowadays, like people try to cancel her and they say that she appropriated indigenous art. Um, you know, that's all nonsense. The point being is that like, I think that the reason Canada is such is because America had a frontier, but it sort of kind of had an establishment of people that were willing to engage in being a frontiersman. Canada 
by ver- by and this is what separates Canada even from America. I mean, America did have a, a very wild wilderness, right? But Canada had a va- has a vast wilderness hmm. that's very different from Europe, especially. So I think that the reason that law and order came first is by virtue of existing in the vast landscape of Canada. Even a relationship before the residential school system to the indigenous people, especially the French, they had to get along with them. Hmm. There there were agreements between Champlain and and the Laurentian indigenous tribes, right? There were agreements between the British down here and the Iroquois Confederacy, the, the Six Nations, because there had to be. We couldn't have existed without it because Canada is such a large, we're all frontier, right? We're yeah. all frontier. And it's not an easy frontier. Not that the American no. West was easy, but it's oh, much, God, harsher, no. much harsher, much yeah. harsher. Yeah. Oh, so you well, need much more yeah. support yeah. and uh, cooperation. Well, hundred percent. That's why Canada, that's why we tend to be, um, you know, more like demure and more like, you know, you do Agreeable. your thing, I'll do mine. Don't bother me. I won't bother you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Americans, like, uh, from what I experience, are kind of different. Like, they they still have, like, um, not to say that Canadians are impersonable, but it's, especially nowadays with, like, um, you know, Canada uh, becoming this, like, you know, post-national state, it's like, you know, people ghettoize themselves, it's like, you know, to talk to, especially after COVID, COVID like broke people's brains. Like, it's like, uh, you know, we don't talk to each other. Um, if anything, the truckers was sort of like, um, man, because a lot of truckers were influenced by America, you know, American conservatism. But, you know, the truckers, after a huge period of social isolation, now we sort of like came together and, and uh, you know, I'm romanticizing it. And there's criticisms of the truckers that I got, you know, that we can get to. Uh, but... I think that like it, it graded from the norm of Canadians being, you know, very like to themselves mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, and you've heard this before with other right wing people on, on your podcast is that, you know, Canadian multiculturalism does breed a form of isolation because it's like, if you can't, um, if there's no common ethos, yeah. then people tend to ghettoize themselves right yeah. uh, go to toronto i mean okay here's the difference like new york if you go to new york right i mean people in new york like whether you want to agree with it or not they still have this like i mean they're being run over by you know rampant mass migration too but like in new york people they're like oh i'm from new york like there's like this spirit you know i mean yeah. i mean maybe new yorkers they like tell themselves that right but if you go to toronto like it's not like um it's not the same awareness of location yeah. where it's like, I'm from Toronto because what is Toronto? Right. Okay. I know there's like a Bojardian, like, you know, uh, the Iraq war never happened. You know, the Gulf war never happened, but you know, Toronto never happened. Right. In, in the <laughs> postmodern sense of like, what do you mean by Toronto is Toronto in a unique city? No, Toronto has a unique history, of course. But I think like the way that people think about Toronto as opposed to the way people think about New York, I mean, very different. Because Toronto is made up of like this amalgamation of different people. New York is also made up of an amalgamation of different people. But there's still like this thing about like, I'm from Los Angeles, I'm from New York, I'm from yeah. Denver. There's a, but in kind Canada, of a patriotism. Yeah, okay. yeah, there's a patriotism yeah. there. But but I mean, the closest in, in in Canada, I would say, would be Montreal because of the uniqueness of their French heritage yeah. and the language. And, and you know, every, everything you're saying here helps me, or I, I feel gives insight into, I, I hosted a discussion slash debate slash argument between local distance and Dave, the distributor <laughs> oh, yeah. a few weeks yeah. back, which was, yeah. um, but Wokel was trying to, towards the end, he was trying to convey a sense of, um, being okay with other cultures that I think you're kind of describing this ability to just let people be themselves and to not cling too tightly to your own identity as a Torontoite or as a Canadian, because you are kind of Mm -hmm. in this multicultural world that a lot of people, because a lot of people from the right watch that 
yeah. video. I don't think that they really understood that Wokel was talking from a from a Canadian point of view that has a different attitude that's kind of counter to that. I don't know if he necessarily articulated it uh, as much, but he was much more fine with immigration, much more fine with just letting his culture kind of bleed out and his kid just gets whatever culture the kid wants and like all these mm. different kind of not clinging so tightly to his uh, cultural identity, um, which is disturbing, or at least the right wing is trying to allow for that. Or Dave's position mm. was that we, we need to allow for people to cling to a culture identity, to even cling to a racial identity if they want to. Um, whereas Wokel taking the more liberal um, point of view is like why that doesn't matter. That can only breed conflict. So yeah. we need to decrease that sense of identity identity yeah well cool it's canadian kind of, yeah he's canadian yeah where is he from uh, uh calgary he's oh, on mountain time no Cal calgary is like the most like <laughs> you know the most conservative part even still that's you know yeah. wow that explains everything actually that <laughs> well i, I, I i'm kind of just shocked i don't know was american yeah. I no he wasn't him. yeah no um but yeah. um to to disengage from the Canadian uh, yeah. civics lesson and then the history and, and kind of the thought experiment of looking at Canada as a playground for the managerial process um, of mm -hmm. ordering people of uh, multiculturalism, what you call airport country, like just this, the global airport as I the call global airport, book, yeah. right? There's global no, airport. there's no isness to it. It's all interchangeable. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, like basically this is the the infamous Justin Trudeau speech and I believe it was after Trump. It must have been 2017 where he said that or maybe 2015 where he said um Canada is the first post-national country. That's the infamous quote. Yeah. And he like I mean, you know, he probably was fed that by some grad student speechwriter, but what that means is like basically that's um Canada being fine with the fact that it has like very shaky grounds in terms of its a like unique identity and that actually a real identity is like just multiculturalism and the global airport society is a post-historical i mean even people say postmodern. i think hypermodern is probably a better term mm. and that comes from people like zygma bauman who coined the term liquid modernity uh i think hypermodern is a better term that like you know canada exists as a weird infoocracy managerial state, but at the same time lacking a cohesiveness in terms of what we think of Canada outside of like ephemeral cultural things like, you know, maple syrup, Tim Hortons, hockey. Um, yeah. By the way, I couldn't believe the Maple Leafs lost two nights in the road to <laughs> Ottawa Senators. I couldn't believe that. Are you a hockey fan, Benjamin? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't, so I don't, there's no way, way for me to watch it. It's not fed to me. So I, I haven't developed a taste to it for it. Mm. I mean, Sorry you could, you could support the LA, the LA Kings. You know, I could but, uh, support the LA Kings. I could do Or the that. San Jose Sharks. Or, you know. Okay. I have a, I have a couple of questions for you. One thing that we were yeah. thinking about earlier, aesthetically, when you were comparing, well, you were taking that, uh, Walter Benjamin quote where, um, yeah. The, the communist uh, politicizes aesthetics, the fascist um, aestheticizes politics. That's one way of like making a distinction between the left yeah. and the right. Another way of making a distinction between the left and the right is that the left, broadly speaking, believes in the perfectibility of man through policy, mm -hmm. expertism, and the right is more... Um, accepts the, the fallenness of man, that it can't be perfected, like this kind of this anti-utopianism more realistic point of view um yeah does that oh. hold uh truth to you i'm just i'm trying to i bring that up because i'm trying to understand what we mean when we say right or what you yeah. mean when you say right or what your friends say when they mean this thing of ours like what what is that and and where where is it going how does it how does it go forward does it go through aesthetics is that is that one way of it going and where are those aesthetics headed that's a big question yeah those now, are a lot of questions yeah let that. me usually i do that i ask people a lot of questions all at once but uh i guess we're the same that way uh but let me just preface anything i say especially with that spiel about canada versus america or the truckers let me just say that like listen okay 
I, I have a voice where people think that I'm an authority I, for some reason, maybe because I talk a lot. I like, lo- I love, I love to hear myself talk, but, um, no, but like, I, I would say that like, there's many people that would disagree with me and I'm no, I'm, I, these are my ideas and that's my perspective. I don't necessarily, um, I don't necessarily speak for the frogs or speak for all, all of Canada or whatever. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a theoretician. I'm more of a, how should you call it? Cultural cartographer, put it that way. Okay. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, maybe I'm, I'm releasing myself of the moral responsibility of uh, being a guru or, uh, you know, yeah. Or justifying leadership. these. Yeah. Or just, yeah. 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 Um, but I would say that, the right wing is again it's there's a postmodern ambiguity in the language of ideology because we live in a world that is determined by the hypermodern of the online right so a lot of these issues you asked um a great question about is all of this viewed through aesthetics i would say yes i would say that the image itself is predicated a worth beyond imagination in the online world that we live in. Whether you want to say that like, this is like being terminally online or this is like, you know, making too much of it. The reality is that we, you know, politics and and culture and society is determined by a different form of socialization that happens online as opposed to quote unquote meat space. Right. And in fact, like this is Budgerard's point, like, you know, the distinction between like the online, the virtual and and the real is like, there's an ambiguity there to the point where those lines become blurred. So it's not that we like live in this like concrete simulation, like the matrix, right? He, he famously hated the matrix because he said like, this is the biggest own to the Wachowskis ever. Uh, he said that the Matrix is the mo- is a movie the Matrix would make, right? Yeah, of itself, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, because it becomes kitschified. It becomes like this concrete representation. When real in reality, he was saying in um in his work is that it's not that we like are concretely submerged in this like online apparatus. Rather, it's that there's no ambiguity. Sorry, there's no distinction between what is virtual and what is real because they feed into each other. Yeah. In terms of the way we process yeah. information, the yeah. way we process ideas about ourselves, right? Yeah. And ideology is like this. So I would say that the image, the aesthetic, informs what we mean by right and left. Now, originally, the right wing means the right side of the French Concord, you know, during the revolution, right? Like they were, they were the anti-revolutionaries. They were the restorationists. They were the the Je- the Thermidorians, the Counter Reformation. Or, sorry, the, the yeah, there was the Counter Reformation. There well, are people that think, interest, landowners, aristocracy. Yeah. They they wanted to hold stability. Um, yes, yeah. Generally, speaking. Uh, a lot of them were monarchists still, or um, yeah. you know, cameralists, as a mold bug calls them, and and so um, people like even go back to the Reformation sometimes, and and the Counter Reformation being like a right wing quote unquote movement of like yeah. social order and stability, but I would say that nowadays. There are elements of the right wing that are still um, obsessed with tradition in the vulgar sense of like going back to what um, traditional notions of gender, traditional notions of social order and so forth. But I would say that this is complicated because there is another aesthetic picture of the right wing that is very um, forward looking and vitalist and Nietzschean and irreverent towards, you know, mm-hmm. things like religion mm-hmm. and, and tradition and so forth. Mm-hmm. And there's more of like, I would say a modernistic version of the right wing yeah. that, that is embodied in people from like Nick land to like bronze age perp. So, um, but there's also like still like the religious traditionalist element of the right wing. So it's very hard to give a unique picture to the right. That's not just like, quote unquote reactionary in the sense of like they're reacting to something yeah. and that they're reacting to the you know predominant left liberal radical liberal social managerialism of of the state right yeah. of of the global american empire so and then there's people that disagree there's people that say that well you know if you're just blaming anglos for everything that's not correct either right like you can't just be like 
you know, that's something like what, uh, you know, Dugan in Russia does, where he's like, you know, it's all the Anglos and there's like this, you know, weird third worldism going on. Right. Um, so I think like these issues are very complicated. But what was the first part that you said about the right wing that we are? Um, do you remember the first part of your question? Uh, well, I was talking about like the I was just adding like uh, the, the left is thinking that there's a perfectibility of man okay. through policy, yeah. whereas the yeah, right yeah, okay. kind of yeah. says man's flawed, man's fallen. Let's deal with that and strive for perfection. Yeah. I don't know. There's like, there's kind of that distinction. I'm not articulating it correctly. I would say that that's largely correct, but there are things that do complicate it. Okay. What I would say is that like, okay, you speak of like this modernist futurist, um, Nietzsche in turn as people like to call it in the right wing. You're right. I would say that there is a version of perfectibility in the right wing but it comes out more in, let's say, um, say if you're like a, a trad cath, right? You're a religious traditionalist, but let's say trad cath or trad orthodox person. Now, you would say that like um, a lot of like trad cath ethos comes from Aristotle, like, the, you know, that man can flourish through measure, through prudence, through, through adherence balancing to, virtues. Yeah. yeah, balancing virtues. And here it's to certain traditions, right? That there is a template of perfectibility through these deeper things in life, yeah. right? Very different than leftist perfectibility, which is like on the political left, it's, it, it comes from liberal tradition, um, where as an individual, there, you know, there once was a, you know, a classical liberal sense of the individual can pursue self-interests. The individual can flourish with like, you know, quote unquote freedom and so forth. And there is a moral order to, to being that is on a timeline that there is a sort of like liberal eschatology that comes from, you know, people mm -hmm. like Immanuel Kant and so forth. C Cthulhu always swims. That's a version of it. That's a version. Yeah. That's a, that's a, like, you know, that's a modern version of it. That's, you know, the contemporary left says that there's a perfectibility of man because there is a malleability to the subject. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But I would say that in contemporary right wing discourse, there also is a perfectibility of man. But instead of the left that views things through individual engagement as a creative being. Um, and then of course, like they always follow along, like it's complicated because like, they're like, okay, you have to be an individual, but you can also be like trans and you have to be like, you know, the, the progressive stack. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that the right wing views the subject as a phenotype, you know, um, my good friend, Catherine D had a great, great article when she was talking about like, uh, avatars mm -hmm. as opposed to like aesthetic images on the right wing. So for example, the left wing would view like their avatar, let's say a furry, right? Let's say a furry or let's say a Picru Avi or whatever, which is like those cartoonish kitschy, you know, with the, the, the flags, the background. Uh, that is themselves. That is who they are. That is their interpersonal subjectivity. I am the Marvel hero that is heck and valid, inclusive and whatever, right? Okay. Yeah. That is a stand in for their individual perfectibility. But when the right wing approaches an avatar, let's say, uh, let's what's a ridiculous example besides like the the, the Roman busts, okay, uh, Giga Chad, <laughs> oh, Giga yeah, Chad. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, Giga Chad, right? So or the Chud Jack, uh, the right wing, the the poster, it's not that they're saying I am that individual Giga Chad or I am that individual um, Roman bust. They say I am the phenotype of the ideal that that thing represents the ideal of giga chat okay. that is unified. That is like something t that is aspirational. Yeah. Whereas the left wing, especially like the zoomers and the millennials that are on the political left in, in the online world to them, their avatar is themselves. It is a perfected and accelerated version of themselves. This is what Catherine D was arguing in her, in her, um, her mm. substack. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the right wing their perfectibility is phenotypical. It's not that I am the individual Giga Chad, 
but I am the essence of Giga Chad because I am a right wing bodybuilder. That I'm the reads, expression of this. Yeah, I am the expression of this because I read Nietzsche. I lift weights. I, you know, so yeah. and and for example, the trad calf, like it's not that they are that individual saint or their individual orthodox icon that is their avatar, but rather they are the representation. So, for example, um, huh. you know those films um, that like. It's not exactly right wing, but it's sort of like coded to be like, you know, towards the right, you know, films like Ryan Gosling films. He's literally me. Hmm. Right. It's not that I am. It's not that like when people say I'm literally him. OK, it's not like you're Travis Bickle or Drive, uh, like in your real life. You know, they're not like who you are as a identity character. But what they mean is like I am literally the phenotype of Travis Bickle. I mean, well, that's a De Niro character, but you know, um, I'm literally Travis Bickle. I'm literally defense from falling down. I'm literally Ryan Gosling in Drive. I'm literally Ryan Gosling in The Believer. Oh God! Oh, have you seen The Believer? I don't think I have. No. Okay, this is the first film Ryan Gosling was in. Get this, and it's a real story, by the way. <laughs> Where he Gosling's is, Canadian, just to put that yeah, out there. Yeah, he's also Canadian. Yeah, where the character of Danny, he's um, I don't know if I should say this for YouTube. He's ethnically Jewish, but also a neo-Nazi. You ever heard of this film, The Believer? Uh, maybe actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he oh, has like this Ryan. identity crisis. Okay, Ryan played that. Yes, that was Ryan a long Gosling, time ago. Okay, that was like, like this was like two thousand one something. Oh, two thousand one. Well, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And and so like the believer um has this rant that like basically summarizes like a lot of like identity like you know white nationalist thought. Um because the guy that wrote the book, it was based on a real guy who actually was Jewish, but he then he was part of like these Aryan na nations groups. And um hmm. he wrote like this dialogue about it and it had to do with like sexuality and uh the book was actually quite an interesting read but in the end like ryan gosling he's the character danny struggles with his identity and he struggles with his own like you know jewish faith and uh so it's funny because when people like say he's literally me they think of like drive they think of um mm. what's well, other ryan gosling characters like the uh notebook. the notebook no well not the notebook, but like um you know, well, the to guy like with young the sex right wing doll? Oh, like uh, oh, Lars and the Real Girl, where yeah. he's got the yeah, yeah. But they also think of like Ryan Gosling and the Believer. So it's like you know, you have anonymous like anime avatar poster. Oh, that's another thing too. Like okay, so like okay, say like you have a, a like a a left wing person who's a furry, right? Their furry character is that. That's the, the avatar that they adopt, right? But say you have a right wing person. A, a young zoomer on the right who has an anime girl who has like a uh, asuka sorry asuka asuka from from evangelion right uh it's not that they're asuka it's not that there's like a gender thing going on it's just they represent like the temperament and the in the attitude of mm -hmm. asuka from mm -hmm. evangelion for example mm -hmm. or like lane well i shouldn't say well lane's an interesting example because lane is an anime that a uh, serial experiments lane brilliant brilliant anime me and prude we actually reviewed it on our show uh that has an appeal to like both right-wing theory cells and to like left-wing trans people <laughs> so you know because it's about like being like submerged in the online world and the wired yeah. right and then lane becomes like the god of the wired the goddess of the wired so okay. um brilliant brilliant anime show uh, if I had to pick one anime I could recommend, it would be Serial Experiments Lane. Uh, very, very heavy theory content for um, way better than Matrix, by the way. W like The Matrix is vulgar Hollywood trash compared to <laughs> Serial Experiments Lane. I know, like, listen, if that guy in the Fed is talking about anime, I know, I know, I know. I know. But, um, so, no, but the, yeah. There's, there's I, one, there's, there's a sociological phenomena. It kind of comes out of Tumblr where yeah. you, you see, um people on Twitter you can tell pronouns in bio um yeah. 
are, are the kind of the, the meeting where you have the, uh, you know, the people with the Ukraine flags and all the shots and, and, you know, they're signaling mm-hmm. something. Uh, and th- those are like kind of the older group, like the boomers and the Gen Xers are like adopting this kind of left wing identity kind of politic. Mm-hmm. But then you have like kind of the, the younger crew, millennials and zoomers who list all of their, um, disabilities like they identify yeah. with ADHD a bipolar and and they are identifying as or their identity like their relationship to identity through online there's an aesthetic that yeah. has uh, and it has certain um downstreams of downstream effects with personality disorders specifically yes. where they start acting more and more narcissistic borderline personality like there's just a lot of bad consequences towards thinking of yourself in terms of your disability identity. Um, and then all the identity politic, the right wing yeah. has an identity politic too. Oh yeah. You're, you're kind of describing it. Oh, um, we have a lot this, of schizos too. I mean, and, God, and you guys God. have a lot of schizos too. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, um, if there was a youth culture, like what are the uh, downstream negative psychological effects mm. from that? Because I'm, I'm seeing, especially with the, uh, detransitioner subset where, where these kids get um, lifted up through Reddit and through online living into this trans identity. Um, They go through a certain amount of um, medical interventions and then they come out, they wake up from that ideology and the ideology is still um, emblazoned on their body. And then they have to go through a a period of mourning for that and then just living with it, Mm -hmm. coping with that and then moving forward. Um, I'm wondering if the right wing has something similar yeah. to it and because it looks like from a certain point of view that it's more worrisome as an older person it's more worrisome the left-wing ideology or the left-wing identity to identity yeah. is more problematic than a right-wing identity uh, identification with identity because there's some sort of irony in there there's some sort of like um, virtue ethic where you're mm-hmm. you're maybe it's that relationship that phenotypical relationship to the ideal like i'm striving yeah. to the ideal i'm embodying the ideal and and it's not like i have to actually engrave that ideal into my body other than working out or other than you know, i guess vitalism would be one counter to that so i'm wondering yeah. what you think about that that's a great question that's a beautiful question because it's asking me to critique uh, my own thing and, uh, you know, not to be too political about it. Right. Cause, but I'm pretty honest, like, you know, I'm pretty yeah. an, an Island. I mean, I don't think there could ever be well, because, like a, because a the, you know, New York times and, and uh, the Atlantic or, or the mainstream media, they, they do a bunch of fear mongering about yeah. right wing online. Like the, those, yeah. you know, if your boy's uh, using these different words, you know, then he's probably part of this right wing radicalism, mm-hmm. but they mm-hmm. also endorse left wing radicalism through the trans stuff, which is a radical yeah. online bred ideology. So yeah. I'm wondering like, is it as dangerous on the right or is there, is there more possibility for actual personal development beyond ideological cult-like dynamics in the right? Right. I mean, uh, as, uh, as a person myself, I would say, obviously it's better for you, but I would say, okay, <laughs> but no, but let me be brutally honest though with, with this. It's cause it's a bit self-reflective. Um, and th- okay, this will shock you. Okay. Because the thing is like, you know, these people are, um, our enemies and they wish to destroy us and they're part of these big activist antifa networks that dox a lot of us and harass us and so forth but i would say that um for those left-wing listeners you have whatever la- left-wing listeners you have left benjamin uh i would say that it is destructive but i understand the conditions by which younger people become uh are seduced by certain forms of left-wing politics and why they list their disabilities and why, you know, a lot of like, and I know it's, it's not just like the broken home I mean, broken homes thing is a big part of it. But like, I think that when, you know, even researching my book, even critiquing the artwork and the activist art of the left, right. What I like to call a neoliberal kitsch uh, and neoliberal is a term that's also complicated and overused. And it's one of those like postmodern terms Uh, Even the left wing hates this. The the right wing hates this term, by the way. So I try to explain like why I use the term, because there is a lot of market forces that go into aesthetic expression nowadays. Right. I would say that like people on the political left, the younger people, especially 
there is a degree of by which there is a fundamental disorder to the world that we're living in. And it's perfectly natural to respond in ways that can guarantee the best outcomes for yourself in terms of political and social power, but also healing a form of existential pain Hmm. that goes into living as a younger person nowadays. And people that generally do have disabilities, people that generally do have identity issues. You know, I, I, for example, I talked to Helena, Helena Kirchner, right? Uh, The the detransitioner. Um, You know, I mean, I I don't fault people. I, I fault the people that promote this ideology. I fault the people at the top, of course. I think they're evil. But when it comes to the ordinary trans person or like left winger that has all the identity markers in their bio and the jab and the flags, it's like, they hate me. They probably want me in a camp or something, but like, I, I still, maybe it's the Christian in me, you know, I, I feel a form of not pity. I mean, it's not good to pity people. And Nietzsche was correct about that, by the way, the pity thing. But I do think that there is a, there is a fundamental sense of things that we are living through are not correct. And millennials in particular live in a world that in a way was robbed from us, you know, after those two towers fell, especially. Right. Mm. So I think that I don't fault people for the choices that they make in a, in a deep sense. And I will get flack for this, by the way, from people on my side, Geo, you're too sympathetic. Geo, you're too wholesome chungus. Geo, they hate us. Yes, they do hate us. They want us destroyed. Obviously that's, you know, that, that Sam I'd quote about like, they want you dead. They want your children. I can't say, I can't say the whole quote, but you know that one. And they'll laugh at you while they do it, right? Yeah. But I think that, you know, the average person that is on the political left, I think that political ideology is deeper than just like theory headspace convictions. I think that there's something fundamental within one's soul that gravitates them towards certain political beliefs, right? Um, just to be totally genuine. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, both positive and negative. I'm not saying that like, because you're a left winger, you have an inherently disordered soul. But I mean, there's a lot of case. There's a lot of right wing people, by the way, who have a fundamentally disordered soul that are gravitated towards certain beliefs for a reason. Now you asked a great question is that, is there a negative consequence or are there a series of negative consequences to young people adopting right-wing ideology? Now I say that the way that it's portrayed, like you said, in left-wing media, in the New York times in Vox in, in like, you know, bread tubers that, you know, have hundreds of thousands of views or Twitch streamers that talk about the radicalization pipeline. It's not that, no, I would say there are negative consequences. Um, I mean, of course, your livelihood is threatened because you're in like an unorthodox political position. Uh, But that's besides the point. I'm talking in in, in inner consequences, right? Because you mentioned the trans thing with the political left. I would say that it's not that you become radicalized and you're going to go commit acts of violence. Now, I abhor acts of violence, of course. And I think, you know, there have people there there have been vulnerable people that have committed, uh, you know, mass the incidences, but I would say that there is a number of problems that the right wing has to sort out when it comes to like, for example, the insult question, right now it's not that like, okay, like, okay. It's like, Oh, it's bad to hate women and all this, be obsessed with it. But I think like there is amount of inner pain that is fostered by like in particular certain segments of the quote unquote manosphere that I'm critical of because it, it really what it does is that it sort of like demoralizes you. Not all, not all of them. There are some good people that do give young men advice that is helpful, but I think that it demoralizes you now, even like the religious trads, there's a, a, there's like a certain zeal among converts and and listen I'm a fan of converts okay now just because I'm a cradle Catholic doesn't mean I'm I'm crapping on converts but I do notice that there's like especially among younger people there's this zeal there's this thing that has to do with being guilty over sexual desire that lends towards like this sort of like ridiculous fundamentalism 
that prevents you from being prudent, if you will. Like just the other day, there was this tweet by someone about like, did you know that holding hands before marriage is evil and it's bad? It's like, no, theologically, like any theologian, any like church father, like even like, like even like Thomas, no, sorry, not Thomas Aquinas, uh, even like St. Augustine, you know, if you read the confessions, he struggled, like he was a ladies man, you know, he, he's like, God, I want to have, you know, the perfectibility of over my own desires, but not yet. You know, yeah. he, he said that in the confession, right? But not yet, you know, please yeah. let me be a coom brain for a little bit. Yeah, he, was a he was like the coom brain of the stamp because, you know, he was like flirting with Manichaeanism and so forth. Um, I would say that also the vitalist, um, this is my perspective. I have a lot of friends in either camp. Okay. I have a lot of yeah. trad friends. I have a lot of Nietzschean vitalist bodybuilder friend I, incredible i have bodybuilder friends right but uh i would say that they also have certain neuros neurotic characters and they have a certain um oh man i really don't want to insult people um i'm i'm trying to choose my words very carefully well there, there there's a proclivity there's a hardening of one's heart that goes on there's a hardening of one's heart and then what happens is because we live in such an alienating character of the alienating conditions, right? Because we live in conditions that are fundamentally opposed to any right wing thought. This breeds a very like sallow and hardened view of life that is very cynical and becomes very like fundamentalist. And it's like, you can't relate to other people. You can't relate to people. Like what happens is they, you know, then you start critiquing each other over very small differences where we agree on 90% of things, but that one little percent is like so dramatic hmm. because we're under siege. And so what happens under a siege like mentality breeds very particular character flaws when it comes to not having an understanding. And there, and unfortunately there has been people that have been bad faith actors. There has been people that have been federal informants. There, there were people that, that, you know, they take a group of vulnerable young men and they grift on them. And, and they like, you know, turn them into little acolytes and, you know, like I'm not naming names, but I'm just saying like, because we are outside of the realm of power, there are power structures that we contend with that because it's, it, it comes from the impossibility of both policing ourselves or the mechanisms by which we police ourselves, but also a lack of agreement on a unified series of discourses that we can all agree on. And so this breeds a lot of like, you know, mm. thousand island tribal thinking yeah, yeah. that, that, you know, it's like, you're either with me or against me. You're either yeah. with me as an East celebrity or you're against me. And I'm not naming names. I'm, I'm just saying that when you don't have the virtue of institutional power, there are other negative consequences to transpersonal relationships in, in, in your group, in this thing of ours yeah. that, do carry it and so i i cut you off benjamin very sorry but i just had to make that point clear and i'm not naming names i'm i'm just saying from my perspective yeah. there are things that the online right wing can work on and 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 you know what the real tragedy is the reason that these issues bubble up is because we sort of kind of no longer have the energy and the spirit of 2016 where we believed that by posting we can change politics and, and I hate to say it, but like, huh. I think Trump will win the nomination, obviously, next year. It's, I mean, it's obvious. Come on. But I think that as much as I love the man, as much as I think he's, you know, a spiritual figure of reaction to the bricklage of liberal managerialism, I think that, you know, 2024 will be very interesting, but it won't be 2016. There was this great poster. Let me, I, I, sorry to cut you off, Benjamin. I'm very sorry. But one last thing I will say to, to answer your question. There was this great twog, frog Twitter poster who left. His name was Minoquion4. He had this great quote, and I'll always remember it. It's the greatest. He said that ever since this day of the election, we will always look for whispers and reverberations of 2016. It is our blessing but it is our curse. Hmm. I'm, I'm butchering the quote, but like, in other words, the E right is obsessed with capturing the energy and, and, and the belief and the optimism 
of what unified us. There are people that hated each other, that hate each other nowadays, but they were unified under 2016 and Trump because they had to be, because we were all caught up in this cultural, how should you call it? And I know the leftists, the leftists, they say this as like proof of like radicalization, but let's call 2016 and Trumpism uh, a cultural and aesthetic upsurge i was gonna say insurgency but that invokes like you know the whole j6 thing and i don't yeah. i want to avoid that i would say a cultural and political avant-garde that was created under 2016 now some people use the language of insurgency like i said i want to avoid that word because of what happened in mm. j6 right um so i would say that an avant-garde is a better term than quote unquote political movement. Yeah. But we're always looking for that again to next year. You're going to see it even, even like more mainstream right wing, like you know, conservative posters, right. They're going to talk about 2016 because that was sort of like our hippie movement. It was hmm. an avant-garde moment. That was a unique breakaway from the norm of politics that have been built up in North America for like 30 years. Right. So, sorry, uh, sorry, Benjamin, I cut you off. I'm very sorry. Go ahead, my friend. No, um, no, you didn't cut me off. Um, I, um, I knew this is going to There happen, are negative but, consequences to being a, a right winger, of course. I'm not yeah. denying that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, there's so many things I, I knew this is going to happen. I have to, I have another call. I have to get on oh, um, man. In, a, in a bit here. And, and I feel bad because we just got into things like, two and a half hours in um yeah. i knew it was going to happen because now i want to explore well because 2016 led to 2017 which was yes. just insanity from the left even though they mm -hmm. yeah they, they didn't get their way and so they just went batshit and then which led to 2020 blah 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 also like i really wanted to get your uh your thoughts on the idw as a response to that and where that fits oh, in God. like whether they're you know like like the <laughs> pardon me, the, the gatekeeping aspects of, mm -hmm. of that movement or, or like how that relates to the right wing and the left wing. And because um, there's just a lot of really interesting things there. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. I'm much more critical of those people. But, oh yeah, well I, I, I'm interested because that, that's kind of like my like that's where I got my start yeah. like in, in yeah. that kind of sphere and stuff. And and I'm trying to fulfill the promise of that, um, you know, that, that little glimpse, like maybe we can actually have conversations about things that we're not supposed to talk about. Maybe we can uh, talk about these things, you know. But like everybody has to police their own reputation. Like, and oh, I yeah. think that's ultimately the the um, the problem with the IDW was that reputation. Yeah, you know what's funny that reminds me of the one last shout out because I recently interviewed him. He's a friend of mine, but um, the writer he used to be a marketing person. The writer Isaac Simpson, um, yeah. Disgraced Propaganda. Yeah, I yeah. love that interview with you, between you two. Yeah, but I interviewed him for my show because he wrote this piece in the American Mind on Vibe Camp. And you'd actually like this because it's sort of like, not that the, ra like the rationalists are kind of like the tech, the tech rationalists are kind of like an extension of the IDW. Yeah. But yeah. he wrote about like how it was weird that in this environment of like, therapy speak and social experimentation that vibe camp is that they had to like tolerate the Yarvinites because like, you know, that would be like freedom of speech. And so yeah. they would talk about like, they would be talking about like human biodiversity and the Austrian painter openly, but they still, it was sort of like frowned upon still, but it wasn't. And it was like a very interesting piece. It's the American mind. I believe it's just called. I went to vibe camp yeah. by Isaac Simpson. Great yeah. piece. Shout out to my good friend. Um, great writer. And I think like uh, it, it, you would love, I, I don't know if you've read it, but it was in the American mind. So uh, great piece. And again, like he explains this like weird intersection between like rationalism, the IDW and people that are more further to the right. Mm -hmm. Although Curtis Yarvin is in like this. I know we've used the term so much weird liminal state of, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not a Yarvinite. I mean, I'm critical of a lot of new reactionary things, but uh, huh. like, I mean, we could get into that later too. I mean, maybe, not to say, listen, not, not to like, uh, you know, get ahead of myself and be like, well, if you invite me on the show again, <laughs> it's like, you know, I would never, I would never do that. Just to quote Trump, 
people are saying this. I would never say this, but people are saying <laughs> I would never I would never show for myself, but I will show for people are saying I should show for myself. I would never do it. Well, actually, but, <laughs> no, please show for yourself now and I will have you back on. But, right. uh, tell us where people can find you um, and, sure. and just plug your stuffs. Well, I want to grow my YouTube channel. Um, my YouTube channel is Genre Productions, but the biggest following I have, most people know me from Twitter. Uh, sorry, X. Sorry, X. Uh, no, mm-hmm. it's it's still Twitter. Uh, g- at Giant Geo. Um, but, you know, uh, subscribe to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Giant Productions, where you, like, most of my podcast content-minded is public, but the special stuff is for the paid subscribers, the full length. Mm-hmm. And um, go I, Substack also includes all of the full length things. Substack.com uh, slash uh, Geo's Content Corner. Um, I had, I have an Instagram. I used to have an old one that got hacked, but, uh, I'm trying to build a website, but this is after, cause currently I'm writing my book and, uh, mm. I want to get it out by early next year. It's going to be oh. an, mostly art criticism, but like a lot of politics. Yeah. Um, I'm on Substack has all of my like free range articles, but yeah, telegram where I have longer rants. Cause maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll pay for Twitter blue so I could do longer rants, but yeah, it, everything's general productions. Um, on telegram and on youtube and the and the patreon and uh i so i don't content mine is my flagship but i co-host with prudentialist it's called the digital archipelago um where we cover arts and culture oh a lot of politics streams too um mm-hmm. but but at the time of this recording we actually this week which is on thursday it's every thursday uh content mine's every wednesday or at least I try to get it on Wednesday. Um, we actually are recording, uh, we're doing a live stream on the show. The, it was this British mini series from the early 2000s. It's called Nathan Barley. And it basically predicted a lot of like internet culture nowadays. Oh, really? So um, yeah, great show. It's only six episodes. You can find it on YouTube called Nathan Barley. Um, so what we do is like I have it one week and then it's on Prudentialist's channel next the the following week. So like we rotate. And then recently I'm co-hosting the computer room with Catherine D. Hmm. So that'll be fun. We we recorded uh, two episodes already. One of them is on this article about uh the Milady Maker NFTs. And uh another one recently we re- interviewed this OG YouTuber called Apple Milk, where hmm. she was like this uh you know, she was this uh, a white girl that spoke fluent Japanese. So she talked about life in Japan and all that stuff. And uh, she came back recently. So great stuff. You know, me and Catherine, we, we're on the same wavelength. But yeah, same with me and Prudentialist. So that's all of my stuff. That's all my shilling. But like I say, next year, hopefully my book will come out. Um, I have a small publisher, but it's just a matter of like doing the first draft, which is, mm-hmm. you know, the more, cause the, cause there's so much content. Oh, yeah. There's so much catch to cover now <laughs> <laughs> politically. Um, just recently I saw this one where they replaced this uh, Confederate stained glass with like this woke stained glass that had like George Floyd protest signs. Right. And I'm like, man, you wow. know uh, yeah, stuff like that. So, uh, but it, you know, I talk a lot about in that book, I talk about Baudrillard. I talk about, um, one of my favorite uh, philosophers who is a living philosopher, but he's not a right winger, but he's a very interesting thinker. His name is Byung Chul Han. He's uh, originally Korean, but he's in Germany and he's a great Heidegger scholar. He's a great scholar of the internet. Hmm. Um, and I, I put a lot of like Mark Fisher and Heidegger and stuff and John David Ebert in there. So uh, yeah, um, it's called neoliberal kitsch art in the 21st century. Hopefully by next year, it'll come out early next year. Um, if I can, uh, you know, get everything ready at that time, it's just like writing a book, like it eats up a lot of oh, yeah. your time. And I've been so spotty with my podcast because yeah. it's eaten up so much time. So, but yeah, man, I have to balance that with my own artwork. I've, you know, that's another thing too, because uh, I have a lot of commissions that people ask me for <laughs> that I have to get to as well. Wait, so, is there a uh, way Instagram is where your art is? Yeah, yeah, I have a Facebook page and Instagram, but I I have a website. I just have to put stock on it so I can okay. start selling my art. Through. I mean, if p- people want art, they DM me, but mm-hmm. um, that's way too inefficient. I gotta I gotta focus on my website. Uh, that that's also called Jenner Productions. Uh, but um, you know, it's I I have to sink time into it after I write my book. Yeah. So um, yeah. 
Yeah, my voice is starting to go a little bit. So <laughs> you, I, I got I to gotta bounce. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry to thank to you, my friend. Call this here, but amazing. yeah, I'm going to have you back on. You're just brilliant, just freaking, oh, thank and you're fun as hell. So I definitely, people will follow you with the links in the description. Thank you, and I'll have you. And back like on I say, soon. I'm a blowhard. I don't speak for anybody but myself. So this is all you know. So. That's, fine. That's fine. You're humble enough. Yeah, that's all I can. Yeah. I try. All right, bro. I'm going to end that. And I, I, get, I really got to bounce. I'm so sorry.